think we are prepared to call to order the 150th meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission uh, on Thursday, April 30th at the Heinz Convention Center today. Um, before we start, I want to welcome, we have a whole new cohort, flock, troop, team of state troopers who have just joined us, who are here in the back. I think we have five new troopers who are going to be working with Lance, your team. I hope you're going to get to know these folks well. Lance George is the the uh, president of Plain Ridge Park Casino. So welcome to you all. We're glad to have you be a part of this operation. You're joining a, uh, a first-rate group of troopers. Um, item on the agenda first is the approval of the minutes. Commissioner McHugh, if you are reoriented, we'll have you do that. Yes, sir. Uh, the minutes of the um, April 16th meeting are in the packet, uh, and I would, as usual, um, move that they be approved as uh, they appear there with the usual reservation of rights for uh, ministerial and technical changes. Second. Second. I, uh, Mr. Chair, I will not vote because I was not at this meeting. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it with Commissioner Cameron abstaining. The ayes have it unanimously with Commissioner Cameron abstaining. Uh, Executive Director Rick Day, administrative update. Good morning, Chairman Crosby and members of the Commission. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning we'll actually be uh, going right to the quarterly report presentation uh, by Penn, which is your tab 3A. Uh, with us this morning we have Lance George, Jack Rowan, Phil Coleman, and representing Pink and Company is Dane uh, Wigfall. Uh, Dane is the on-site monitor there as well. Uh, followed by this report of the quarterly report, then Shannon Wells and Lance uh, will provide the Commission a staffing update for Plain Ridge Park Casino. Jack? Thanks, Rick. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My quarterly opportunity to talk to you. It's great. Happy to have you. By the time the next one comes up, we'll be open. So right. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. That is exciting. Time, time is flying. Yeah. It's flying. It's great. Uh, we we uh, filed with you on Monday our quarterly report as of March 31st. Uh, we think it gives a um, pretty good insight of uh, where the project's at. Uh, I'd like to do what I've done with you in the past, and that's just touch on some highlights and then uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have. So uh, at this point, obviously, we're in, we're in high gear on, on all fronts, uh, construction work on the site, construction work off the site for the roadways, uh, the, our owner fit out and equipment, and all the operations preparation. So as you might imagine, uh, less than 60 days out, everything is in high gear now. In uh, uh, Appendix 2, we comment on schedule, and, and as you know, we've now, uh, well, we are certainly on schedule uh, for a June opening, but uh, in the past quarter, we have specified an, uh, a test date of June 22nd and a formal opening date to the public of uh, June 24th. So uh, schedule's always been, uh, <clears throat> you know, captioned as aggressive but achievable, and, and we think that that's our daily existence, uh, and we just take it one day at a time, and we continue to execute under our construction schedule and, and the fit-out as well. Uh, part of uh, Appendix 2 is a, a list of non-construction activities. I uh, don't want to touch on, on any of the particular details other than to say that we, this is a, a, a schedule and a list of activities that we work very closely with Lance, with Rick and his staff, uh, to monitor those things that we all uh, know have to get done and addressed before in order to help us open. So there's many things on there, and it's a, it's a, a high area of coordination for our, our whole team. Uh, let's see. In Appendix 4, we gave you a, a whole series of photos, uh, some as of the early part of April and some more current. From some of the aerial shots, you get a good sense of uh, a much more completed casino building. You can see the photovoltaic panels that are uh, on top of the building. There's some uh, interior shots as of uh, the end of the month that show the uh, interior features on the gaming floor taking shape and in the racing building. And then we included a, a series of pictures, uh, more recent, that are much more colorful and exciting that show the completed 
live racing area on the first floor of the racing building. Uh, the, uh, some more shots of the uh, casino interior with carpet down and slot bases down, which are significant milestones for us. And then there's a, uh, a, a few pictures far less colorful, but, but uh, even, you know, are just as important, showing the progress we're making in the back of the house, kitchens uh, in particular, and then uh, the start and, and continuing work on the off-site roadway improvements. So we hope those uh, photos uh, give you a good sense of where we are. Yeah, they do. Okay. What's the uh, design strategy for the carpet? I have something like you would never have in your house. <laughs> <laughs> something that's going to make you look up. Make you look dizzy, right? No, look up. Look up? Oh, all right. Uh, yeah, and as an accountant, I would never have it in my house. But I think that the, the, the fundamental always is you give customers something that they don't normally see. Right. And something that colorful is not something you normally yeah, see. Yeah. Right. It's Just a pattern right. we use in a lot of our properties, and customers have always reacted well to really? it. Really? Interesting. Hmm. Always. Do you, have the, do you have the carpet up, Amy? The ones with the carpet? One back. So, there you go. Yeah. Uh, those middle, sh middle right gives you the idea. <laughs> yeah. It's colorful. It's colorful. <laughs> Jack, um, can you just uh, briefly touch on completion of the outside uh, road, roadway improvements, the median, uh, the, the left turn into the into the property? I'll, I'll give you the highlights and then I'll, I'll ask Phil to, to sure. okay. delve a little more into the details. But you know, right now the, there's um, several big pieces of the work, the, ent the entry to our property itself, the uh, s work on the southbound 495 off-ramp is, is, is quite far along, and then the, the actual work in the roadway median. And we've been digging and tearing that up for, for a couple of weeks now. So all three of the big pieces are in, in full gear and, and on track for somewhere around the 10th of June or so, but you may want to comment mm -hmm. a little more. Sure, Philip Coleman of Turner Construction Company. So the offsite uh, roadway improvements, as Jack mentioned, we're basically targeting that 98% of the work be in place roughly that first week in June. We're working very closely with MassDOT, who's been very cooperative with us uh, thus far. Um, every day there's actually, <coughs> out on the roadway itself, we have not only the uh, private improvements of um, the Route 1 roadway, but also Engrid has several crews out there because they are developing and installing their uh, power supplies to the casino and to the, what's known as the mid station. So right now we're pretty well on course. We, we have a lot of um, activities going on on a daily basis. We're about to start doing some night shift work uh, including grinding and milling of the pavement. Uh, we expect that in roughly three weeks from now, we'll be starting the overlay. Uh, we're working with MassDOT on the closure of that southbound off-ramp for basically a five-day period so we can merge in the new uh, alignment of the roadway. And uh, so things are progressing uh, very well. And our intent uh, with MassDOT basically is somewhere in that first week in June, basically to go through a certification process with the uh, engineers from MassDOT. Great. John. You know, we, we've had uh, occasion to talk to you um, over the tenure of this project about the struggles in getting to our MassDOT permit, and we did have our struggles, but I want to echo what Phil said, uh, you know, now that the, the work was permitted and the work has started, <coughs> the cooperation out of MassDOT's District 5 has been exemplary. So That's great we hear. struggled once, but we, we are certainly getting the benefit of their help right now. Great. great. And you're comfortable that rain, for example, won't <laughs> delay you? Well, there will, there will be that occasional rain uh, the rainfall that will probably Shift lose a, a day here or a day there. But for the most part, we got that in the program for great. a schedule. Great. Okay. Uh, going on any, to any a pen. Oh, go ahead. Please. Well, I just ask, you know, any unexpected surprises? I mean, what's, what's hit you? What, what keeps you awake at night? What's <laughs> I, get, I get asked that uh, pretty much every week. Right. <laughs> you know, we, we have, um, I think we have a good plan. We've always had a good plan. We're good at, at building casinos. We're executing under that plan. Uh, we have a good, uh, diverse workforce, excellent commitment on the part of the subs, 
excellent commitment on the part of our key suppliers. So all those things are working well. Turner does a good job of being the, the field general. Those things are working well. Our challenges, uh, every, time, uh, um, every time you deal with an existing building, there are challenges. Every time you open up a wall, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, so that's a challenge. You get out onto the roadways. I mean, we <coughs> never worked out there before. You tear up something, it's not what it's supposed to be. You, you, you see a problem that you didn't foresee. But um, we just deal with them day to day. So the, to answer your question, Commissioner, the, it's, it's dealing in the racing building with the unknowns and, and dealing out on the, on the highways with the unknowns. But we just take them one, one day at a time. I think one other comment I, I would add to that, it, and it echoes uh, what Jack said pretty much. It, it, it's the workers in the field who are making this happen. The subcontractors and the workers who have to respond and react quickly and, and, and be very flexible with respect to, uh, you know, how do we handle those situations that come up on a daily basis. So we're very fortunate to have some very good subcontractors on board. Over 300 people every day. What are we? We're now over 300,000 hours in the job to date, and that's a lot of people and and a, and a lot of talents. So, I hope that answers your question. Yep. Uh, going on to Appendix Five, I wanted to bring to your attention uh, a change from the prior quarters. Um, this. Uh, letter from Saul Riebstein, our CFO, uh, reports project costs at 250 million. In the past, uh, reports that number has been 225 million. In this quarter, uh, well, let me back up a step. His, uh, the, the history of this project has always envisioned some element of equipment financing that we would buy certain ones, lease certain ones. So it was always 225 million plus some leased equipment. Uh, based on some advice from our corporate finance department, they've said areas where we were planning to lease, not the wisest move, buy this, buy this, buy this, essentially buy almost everything in, in the plan. So, are you talking, uh, are you talking about um, slot, slot machines? machines? Yeah. Slot machines, slot machines yeah. uh, uh, HVAC equipment, kitchen equipment. There was a whole portfolio of things we contemplated leasing that now, based on advice from our finance department, it's better that we buy. And so now we are putting the leasing aside, going forward, purchasing with almost everything under the project, and that's why we went from 225 to 250 million. Hmm. Jack, looking at that sheet, <laughs> still under building construction, and, and to a lesser degree, gaming and operations equipment, you still have a pretty big dollar figure there in terms of stuff left to be spent. Uh, I kind of know what it is, obviously, now for gaming and operations equipment. What what is in that kind of 50 million dollar uh, figure with respect to building and construction. Yeah, that, that number is as of March, so we've got three more months of construction and we're running about $12 million a month. Okay. Plus retainage and other things, so it is, it is the, can, you know, the payout of the rest of the work. Okay. And it's, it's right where we thought, saw ourselves being at this point. Okay. So you're definitely on budget for this project. And you explained why, you know, with buying some additional equipment. Right. In your experience, is that somewhat unusual, or is that? Uh, every project has its challenges and dynamics. Right. Uh, you know, our, our long history has been to be in the ballpark of our budgets, and that's where we are on this one. Mm. Just so many large projects you hear about uh, running over budgets, so I think you're, obviously the team is working well to keep it on budget. Uh, you know, it, it's been our history, Commissioner, and, and on this one, uh, we are in the ballpark of our budget, that's for sure. Great. Uh, let's see. Um, going on to number, uh, appendix number seven. Skip six. Six was um, it, it just a, a list of uh, design and, and construction. Uh, licensing, uh, the, the licensing of certain of our key vendors and all that, so nothing particular to report there other than the licenses we need for our suppliers we have. Okay. No, number seven is um, a little bit lengthier than normal, but it, it just gives you the highlights of where construction's at. Uh, in, in this particular quarter, we're, we're pointing out certain key milestones 
We uh, got the certificate of occupancy for the garage and related offices. We've got the certificate of occupancy for the live racing area and that, that uh, live racing resumed on April 15th. We got our permit and started uh, work for the off-site roadway improvements. And on the uh, second page of that particular uh, appendix, we've engaged consultants to do uh, the baseline traffic studies that our host and surrounding community agreements require. So besides the normal construction, we had a series of real important milestones uh, in terms of certificates of occupancy this quarter. Uh, on to uh, Appendix 8, this is the project uh, construction workforce. We uh, committed to certain goals for minority women and veterans actually working on the site. And this is an update uh, of, of those uh, goals and where we're at. As of the end of March, we've uh, exceeded 300,000 direct work hours on the site. Uh, we have, are currently at 16% workforce participation for minorities, which is right on our goal. We are at 3% uh, women versus a goal of seven. There are areas of the project we continue to struggle on in terms of female <coughs> representation. And in, in the most macro of sense, it, it boils down to one thing. Certain of the trades just aren't well represented, not just for our project, the area as a whole, and that's the workforce we have to draw from. So, uh, is and that true nationally in those trades? I defer that one to Phil, but I, I would say that is pretty true nationally. Yes. Do Do you still have um, subcontracts to let out? You know, in the um, that that may make a little bit of a difference at, at this area? point we are substantially committed okay it's, it's now just uh, executing so my, my sense is based on where we're at now commissioner these numbers probably are a good representation of what you'll see at the end well we'll end up for the whole project mm -hmm. and and you know while we are you know struggling a little bit on the female side when you take a step back and look at all three minority women and veterans you know we, we're pleased with the results right uh, we think we're taking yep. the best advantage of what the market has to offer and I think Turner's done a good job of finding the right subs, keeping an eye on, on the participation, and doing corrective action where and how we can. Mm -hmm. I think the only limitation is, has been what the market has to offer us. Uh, let's see, that uh, we can go on uh, to uh, Appendix uh, 9. which uh, is the periodic report we give you on contracting on the construction side. Uh, we've been talking to you about this for several quarters now, and uh, we have done exceptionally well here. At this point, we are substantially all committed and let out. So again, the numbers you're seeing here are really representative of what the project will be when we close it out. And that's on the minority side. We're at 10% contracting versus a goal of four. Women 13, or WBE, sorry, 13% uh, versus a goal of seven, and veterans 9% against a goal of three. Uh, all in all, uh, not much change from the numbers we've been reporting. This is where they should end up. And uh, we're, as we have been, very pleased. That's great. Yeah. Great numbers. Yeah. See, uh, probably uh, the, the only other comment I wanted to make uh, or to bring to your attention was appendix number 12. And this is really the first um, opportunity we've had to report against uh, our diversity plan for the fit out of furniture, fixtures, and equipment. We have a plan that calls for 3%, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 6% uh, MBE participation on the fit out, 12% WBE, and 3% veterans. At this point, we are about three quarters of the way committed in, in the procurement of all the, the goods under this program. And right now, we're at uh, against a goal of 6% for MBE, we're at 3%. Against a goal of 12% for WBE, we're at 16%. And against the goal of 3% for veterans, we're at 18%. So again, a, a mixed bag, but all in all, uh, if, if you look at it you know, as a whole, we're uh, substantially ahead of the goal. 
And at this point, not only have we committed about three quarters, but we've paid about uh, over 50% of those commitments at this point. Is this a subset of the earlier number? or is it's, this it's a different program. It's a different category. Right. One, one commissioner is purely construction. Right, okay. And this one is furniture, fixtures, equipment, right. anything from signage to the surveillance equipment to front of house furniture, back of house furniture. Right, okay. Uh, pretty much everything but slot machines and the slot system, which are very unique purchases that y you can't buy on any type of minority basis. Right. But it's the rest of the program, and it's it's r roughly twenty million dollars worth of, of of procurement. Okay, great. And that was it in terms of formal comments. Happy to address any questions or any other questions, thoughts. Commissioner Cameron. No, excellent numbers. I, I really see it's it's apparent that you are are committed to this and uh, making very good. Uh, you know, really getting the numbers you're looking for here, so. We're, we're pleased with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to, you know, we certainly want to help you in the in the remaining months, try to maybe bump up some of that MBE participation. Uh, see if we can get closer to the 6%. The MBE or, M, or minority employment? The MBE, MBE the minority on business. On the, on the oh, for the equipment side, yeah, for right. the uh, fit out, yeah. Any thoughts would uh, would be appreciated. Okay. Okay. Well, I, you know, we've as as we've gone through this, you know, we know uh, I, I've gotten a couple of calls from Lance where he's like, I got a great veteran business lined up, ready to do business with us, but for whatever reason, they don't want to go through the licensing process or, or what have you. Um, but you know, the best we can do to help you kind of look under every rock and stone to find a, find a participating business. You know, we want to do that with you. You know, time has moved very fast on this project, and uh, now, now that you look back a little bit, you say we, we've had remarkably little pushback from subs and suppliers about the whole licensing process. Okay, good. So, and it, 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 I guess that's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> Permitting, permitting in Massachusetts has always been known to be pretty efficient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> With a heavy dose of sarcasm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is very exciting to see this come together. It was an aggressive schedule. It it's, uh, continues to be one. It's, uh, the pieces are falling into place, and that's not by accident. Um, so I think this o is a always been really looked good at report. by us as aggressive but achievable. I think right. that's the way you're supposed right. to set schedules. Right. I think your consultants have drawn the same conclusion pretty consistently, and uh, time is flying, and we're we're getting this close. And right. every day is aggressive but achievable. Right. right. It's great to see. Yeah. Okay. The, Thank you. There are a lot of things that are that are good. I mean, the big one is is knock on wood being on schedule and more or less on budget, um, but. Uh, Diversity commitments, as you well know, are often honored more in the breach than in the, the implementation. And it's it's been noted that you guys have really set this out as a as an important priority and worked hard on it. And it, it, we know it takes work. It's important to us. It's important to the statute. You did get some press coverage, which is great. The press took knowledge of the fact that you had really exceeded your diversity objectives in the procurement side, which was great, and you deserve that. But um, we. We want to make note of that because it not just get lost in the shuffle that you've actually put your shoulder to this wheel and, and we appreciate that now on the development side you get one chance to do it right you don't have 10 years to develop and mold the plan we get we get one chance right. and we're, we're pleased with the way it came together so thank you yeah just curious Jack what uh, what is typically your involvement after opening your development uh, department uh, there's always several months of uh, working very closely with Lance and his team on, uh, you know, oftentimes those things that you planned and thought would work don't. Mm -hmm. uh, or if customers have, uh, you know, the, the response has been different and you change, uh, changes are necessary. Right. So for us, there's always two to three months of, of very close coordination after we open with Lance and his team and with Turner's help to uh, correct things that either we planned but didn't work out well right. or need change for some other reason. And, and during that same period of time, we wrap up all the financial affairs of the subcontractors and suppliers. 
So there's, there's a, a, a 90 day pretty intense continuation. Great. Thank you. Okay. Can this Lance? No. Okay. Go to the staff. Thank you. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Jump right in staffing. Yes, sir. Perfect. Good morning. Again. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, with me today, I have uh, Shannon Wells, Vice President of Human Resources, talk a little bit about staffing. I would say, uh, in general, uh, delighted to, to suggest that we remain on schedule, no major setbacks as it relates to staffing. Uh, commencing next week and then through about the first 10 days of June, we'll see a significant ramp up. Uh, interview schedules are, are full, no doubt about that. and. Uh, we continue to be delighted and, and amazed at the, the quality and the quantity uh, of the talent pool and the applications that we've received. So uh, with that, I'll turn to Shannon to walk through the slides. Very good, good morning. Good morning, good morning, Thank Shannon. Thank Pull you the for mic allowing over. me to. Pull the mic over, Shannon. Oh, sorry. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, so we'll go through a quick overview. Um, first thing I'll talk a little bit about is our community outreach and communication that we've done. Um, starting back in February, um, we were able to go speak at the Brockton Chamber of Commerce. Um, we have several partnerships, I'm sure, as most people in the room know, with our Workforce Development Career Centers. Uh, we participate with them in, in job fairs, um, working with them to hire great slot techs. And we, I was able to go to the beautiful State House and speak to um, that group in, in March. So that was a, a wonderful experience. Um, also working with Massasoit and Bristol Community Colleges. Here we're really um, looking into some training opportunities as we get into the mass hiring, uh, mostly on the culinary and F&B side with Serve Safe and TIPS. Um, also working with Veterans Inc. Um, the wonderful thing there is some of our partnerships with the career centers have afforded us um, the opportunity to hire veterans so, um, we've actually hired two that were referred to from the career centers. Also working with the New England Area Com um, Conference uh, NAACP. And then um, some people in this room were at a meeting um, in March with the career centers, community colleges, and the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development. So the next slide will kind of walk through some of our job fairs that we've done. Started early on in October, actually I, I came out to these um, prior to even being employed. And- Just for the fun of it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it, it actually was beautiful then, it was fall and gorgeous and I thought, I, I wanna move here and then <laughs> got here in December. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, Quick change of mind. Right? Yeah, <laughs> too late. Um, so we started our ramp up really in March and April in, in most of our job fairs um, to get to where we are now, which is our mass hiring. So next slide. Wanted to just kind of give you a visual of our applicant pool. Um, looking at mostly just the Eastern Mass, Southern Mass area and a little bit of Rhode Island is where our applicants are coming from. And the next slide, we kind of gave you our top 10 out of the over 4,000 applicants. These are the communities that are in our top 10. And most of our host and surrounding communities are in that applicant pool, in the highest level of applicants. Okay. Um, now, are, are these, these are not uh, typically applicants with gaming experience, right? Correct. Um, yes. So it's uh, it's food, uh, beverage. Um, what else? Um, slot operations. Um, IT, IT accounting, human resources comes to mind. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, back of house administrative jobs that we've hired for out of the gates. Yep. That you've hired for uh, early that we've already uh -huh. brought on board. And and, and then and, and then they go through a training program to acclimate themselves with the specific needs that you have. Is that right? Yeah, certainly I think uh, less training needed maybe in the areas of accounting mm -hmm. and IT, right. Um, right. more training needed for, for front of house positions, uh, gaming specific. Right. 
a little bit of, uh, not surprising, a little bit of a learning curve with the language yes. and the vernacular, but they pick it up quickly. Yes. Right. Are the community colleges uh, uh, supply, uh, you, you mentioned them a minute ago, mm -hmm. uh, are they supplying a significant number of applicants? We, we went to sit with them in Brockton and do a job fair. We had a lot of interest, um, mostly on the culinary side. Yeah. So it still remains to be seen who we will actually get right. from right. that group. Right, right. Okay, thanks. So just to take a look on the next slide is our um, hiring goals to date. Uh, we are exceeding on the diversity side of 17% and our local new hires were at 37 percent. What are the two objectives? Um, objectives are 90 percent local, uh, which is the host and surrounding communities, and 10 percent diversity. We, we've got some work to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with that being said, I think as of yesterday we had 77 folks on board, and as you guys know, we'll be hiring 500. So early numbers were obviously encouraged with the diversity numbers, plenty of work to do on the, on the local side. With that, we end up with folks who are in Walpole, for instance, or, or Norfolk, who fall just outside of mm -hmm. our local right. communities. Yeah, we do expect an uptick in the local. Um, first indications of our invites to our group interviews is what we're doing now for mass hiring. Lots of local uh, host and surrounding community folks. And you just, uh, I, I think you had surrounding community agreements all had some, a promise of at least going to each surrounding community and staging a day. Does that translate back into the dates and the meeting schedules that you had aligned before? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is the 90% the 90 is that a best efforts? How is that characterized? It is a best efforts. Yeah. Yes. Correct. It's uh, certainly these numbers are top of mind on every hire we make. Mm -hmm. um, again, feeling good about where we where we started with diversity. We we recognize and we've had several meetings with uh, with our local constituents. We've got some work to do on the local side. Yeah. <clears throat> so next slide. This is where we are on our hiring timeline, and I like to say that a picture is worth a thousand words here. Um, we're sitting in April at approximately 81 employees, and you'll see we have to get to 500 in June. So the purple bar there suggests that we have a lot going on in the next seven weeks. And we have um, begun, we're on target, we've begun our mass hiring. Um, this is, this is the, what I'm dreaming about every night. <laughs> so we're excited. Um, by May, we should have 300 on staff. And then June, which is really the first few weeks of June, up to the first three weeks of June, we'll have the 500 new hires. Um, are you keeping track of, um, of the pool of applicants that you have who may be uh, unemployed or is currently employed? Are you, are you getting any of those statistics? I have not yet. Um, I thought we were. I thought we saw those numbers yesterday. Didn't they show? Didn't didn't they show that the number of people in Plainville that that were unemployed, part timers or otherwise? I think you may be right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the, maybe we're doing that. Is MGC collecting we, that? We're collecting that for for the data project, project with UMass. Oh. Everybody who gets licensed or registered fills well, out a quick questionnaire as to actually, where they're coming from. We we are keeping track of who's hired. Yeah. Was, but I, my, my question was perhaps oh, the applicants. As, 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 on the oh, okay. uh, as on the applicants. Yeah, I don't think our system has a mm -hmm. actual a way to identify. tracking. Yeah. Uh, but it is interesting. We didn't even know. Uh, Elaine and I talked about this. We, we didn't realize that, that, that MGC is keeping track uh, when you when we eventually when you eventually hire someone they go through our licensing or registration process we know how many unemployed right. people part-time and fully employed we're Cause, hiring because yeah. mm -hmm. that's a form that we have them complete when that's they become form. part right. part of the license mm -hmm. yeah that's great yep. so the next slide will go through our licensing submittal this is obviously um a big challenge on both sides. Um, we're definitely excited about how much the licensing team is working with us. 
we realize it's a, a huge, huge undertaking. Um, so our goal is t by May 27th to have all the GEL licenses and temp requests that we submit with those. Um, Tell the, the audience what GEL means. I'm um, sorry, yes, gaming, game, gaming employee licenses. So there's three. There's the key license, and there's a gaming license, and there's also a registrant license. The registrant licenses are approved the day they are submitted, pr provided they're submitted properly. The gaming licenses go through a bit more scrutiny, and of course the keys, um, a, a lot of uh, scrutiny. And then by June 10th, our goal would have all the registrant ap applications submitted, and then June 17th, all positions hired and trained and, and ready to roll. I know you, you all have been coordinating on this, but how are we feeling now about our ability to, do, to match our side of this? I was, uh, as uh, Shannon was speaking, I started from the place that, uh, that the first number she had with the 81 by the end of May, uh, we, we reconciled that and we're in agreement in that position and we've established four licensing days to go down, uh, for our staff to go down to Penn to actually do some mass licensing on site. Uh, so I, I think we're basically, we're, we've kind of got a process where we're checking in uh, twice a week. Uh, I believe that we're, we're on track with them as well. Great. And a lot of credit to the IEB and all the troopers sitting back who are doing all the background checks and because they're, I mean, it's inevitable that they're going to come in in a crush and it's hard for you, but it's also hard for us. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Chairman Crosby should mention also uh, uh, our two uh, have been permanent licensing folks, uh, um, Bill Curtis and, and Kathy Bartsch. They're, they're pulling a lot of weight here as we get moving forward and been real, um, working real hard to make sure those license applications get processed. Great. I would agree with that. We've had uh, tremendous communication on mm -hmm. both sides. Uh, they work, uh, they're working a lot of hours. We're hearing from them on Saturdays, on Sundays, late at night, so they're certainly uh, helping us out. Good. And the tro troopers come to property and do fingerprinting, which is a huge advantage for us as well. Great. But, um, could you um, give us an order of magnitude of where you are on the uh, key gaming licenses in terms of percentage? Yeah, we have about have 25, 27 to submit, and we have submitted approximately 18, 16 okay. to 18, I think we're at right now. Okay. Yes. And uh, the, what about the GELs? Um, submitted approximately 50, so that leaves us about 140 more to go. And then in the next few weeks, we'll, we are working very hard to have another 50. So by the time we have the licensing events, we'll have two licensing events, we'll have 100 more to go by then. I didn't realize there were so many GELs. No, but she's including the service employees in the GELs. Oh. No, there's a, no. about 185 gaming total. Wow. Okay. And w when you say GELs, Gaming that's, employee licensee. Yeah, yep. I thought I thought your description of it included the reg the registered. No. no. Oh, okay. No. Oh, okay. Separate. Yeah. yeah. Our registrants are approximately 260, 270 right. registrants okay. on top of that. Is that it? <laughs> yes. Uh, next slide. Just a quick overview on training. We will start our mass hiring orientation the first two weeks of June. Um, those will consist of, a, of meetings and training of about 30 team members per session. We'll have some sister property come in and help us because we know that will be um, a lot going on at that time, not, not just with training, but getting everything to come together at once. Um, we train on our culture, we train on core values, red carpet customer service, which is a customer service program that we use at all pen properties. Safety, uh, lead gold, uh, anti-harassment policies and procedures, and also responsible gaming will be included. They are about a six to eight hour training. They're held on site. And then once we get done with their orientation, they go directly into the department specific <coughs> training. Would you, uh, uh, if any, myself or any of my colleagues or staff were interested in just coming down and witnessing your training, would you be amenable to having us sit in the back of the room and not make any noise? Of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
thrilled, right? <laughs> Just no heckling the <laughs> trainer if yeah, it's me. Exactly. <laughs> You're the trainer? And some of them, yes. Right. I will be doing some. We'll be splitting up with uh, my team. You would just have to reschedule the part about the commission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's secret. <laughs> Is that it? That's all I have for you. Yeah, if you don't have that's any more great. questions. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you very much. All right. Next up, Information Technology Director Glennon. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm here to, first I want to make a correction. The third slide in your deck should be titled uh, Central Management System Project Update, not Gaming Laboratory. It's my oversight. I'm here today to give you an update on the CMS project. Um, very pleased to inform you that the contract between IGT and the Commission was executed on April 22nd. That allowed a lot of the activities that need to take place, especially in the procurement area, uh, for IGT, uh, formerly GTEC, uh, to move forward. They had uh, they had some infrastructure they need to procure parts, et cetera. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I, I want to call out um, uh, Edward Jordan, who is the project manager out of Moncton for IGT. Um, the uh, project plan here and the executive summary, which we'll be going over, um, uh, were provided by Edward. I think he's watching. Uh, he and his team have been great, um, and we had a kickoff. Uh, in, in April, and we've had several meetings since um, with uh, members of our team. So the finance group, Derek Lennon uh, and Maria Patari uh, for the revenue folks, um, and Bruce Band and um, Vanessa Barone uh, on the uh, IEB side. So we have looked at requirements. We have, uh, I believe, a baseline uh, for the initial uh, installation of the, the software. Um, and a detailed project plan, um, which is attached. Um, my idea would be um, to report out to you in the format of the executive summary that's attached here. Um, I think it is traditional uh, project management reporting. It's a dashboard type of, uh, of, uh, of an approach, calling out uh, high-level milestones um, along with the status of those milestones and any risks uh, or issues that we're dealing with related to those. Um, the detailed project plan, uh, which is uh, in the form of a Gantt chart, is available. Um, we have integrated um, the critical path and the activities of the CMS project with the gaming floor uh, opening um, for Penn. So as they move through the gaming floor and configure the slot machines, there are some activities which we'll be able to do that will um, eliminate the need for work after the opening, right? There's some preparation that needs to be done in the slot base for the central management system, uh, equipment that needs to be put in, and Penn had asked that we do this um, concurrently with their build out of the slot floor so that they're not, it's not disruptive after opening. Uh, you don't have the, the bases opened up, et cetera. So that's the way the project plan has been developed. Uh, we've had a meeting with the Penn folks, Mike Toma, uh, slot operations, uh, Albert De La Garza, their slot manager, and their IT folks. So I think everybody is pretty much, um, we're all on the same page. There's good communication and collaboration, um, and things are moving forward. Um, I, I think um, I'm pretty comfortable that uh, where we are right now uh, is in good shape. So everything is, uh, it, and I'll entertain any questions on any of the material, either the detailed Gantt uh, charts or the, um, the executive overview. Um, but I would ask that you um, approve the overview as a format for uh, for us to report out, up to you uh, relative to the status of the project. Anybody? I think the overview is clear. It is helpful. It is, uh, keeps, uh, helps us keep that track of the essentials uh, without getting um, into a morass of detail. I think it's a good, uh, uh, I think it's a good way to, to proceed with the, with the reporting and tracking from our standpoint. In the um, Gantt chart, there are a number of red lines. I assume red lines on the Gantt chart mean the same thing as they do on the executive summary? But those are, those are at-risk yeah, items? Yeah, I, th I think they're, they're calling out some critical path items um, that, that we need to be um, 
responsible for uh, the network operations center and the build out. We're going to need to put uh, a temporary location into place because the permanent knock is going to be, um, you know, on the floors that we're building out. So we need to figure that out. Um, and uh, up until this week, the question of who the lab was going to be that handled the certification. Um, well, actually, we haven't made that decision yet. I take that back. We've selected labs to do the certification of the gaming floor, the slot machines, and the house system. Um, we are getting further uh, clarification on the statement of work to certify the central management system. So of three uh, tasks that we had put out to bid for the certified independent laboratories, we've, we've, uh, we've um, awarded three of those tasks. Um, two of them to uh, GLI, and that's the validation of the slot machines and the slot floor. And then the third task was, um, is the tote system at Plain Ridge, and we awarded that to BMM. Uh, we have, uh, we still have some work to do on um, the CMS system. But that's, that, we'll get that done in the next couple of weeks, um, and G, uh, IGT is going to provide us some addif additional granularity on the requirements for uh, testing and certification of the CMS. But more so. broadly, the, the color scheme on the Gantt chart is not the same as the color scheme on the, on the uh, executive overview. Is that right? I believe that's correct. And if we need to harmonize those, I can no. certainly speak to no, no, Edward. I, just, but I, I wasn't actually planning on making this Gantt chart a part of my right. update for you because I think it, it tends to be in the weeds a bit in terms right. of the detail. It's, do we have any issues with the activities on this chart will be called out in the executive summary. I, 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 wasn't, I, w I wasn't making a suggestion. I was just making an observation. That it's yeah. Well, the only, the only question in the executive summary is whether there is sufficient granularity there to actually, I mean, presumably behind this, you and Rick and others will know what's going on. It's, you don't need us to catch highlights, but we do want to know about issues and whether execution is a huge category that basically covers, you know, two-thirds or more of the whole thing, and to have one big chunk there, um, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a little bit concerned, and that's why I was wondering about these things that are read. If these things that are read on the Gantt chart don't mean there's an issue, a problem with them, then, then this specific example of my concern goes away. Um, but yeah. it's just, there's just not very much granularity in this chart, and it, it, you need to be really hard-nosed for, for our purposes, you need to be really hard-nosed about reflecting what are potential risks um, in, in these huge categories like execution. So I would call your attention to the last page of this summary, which is the risk chart. I think there are three items on that, four that are called out. Um, we will expand this to identify anything, any things that would tend to indicate we were going to deviate from the plan uh, or that there are issues that we need to work through either with um, Penn or with IGT, so or with our own staff. Red on this chart means what? Red on this chart means cr critical. Critical, but not at yeah. risk. Oh, I think, okay, so Mr. Chairman, can, are you talking about the Gantt chart? No, I'm on Just your milestones clear. chart. The risks chart. The, what you referred milestones, to is the risks. No. Yeah, so on milestone. the executive it says report, milestones, but he on, to on the executive himself. report, I think if like, it's oh. if it's green, it's good. If it's yellow, it's caution. If it's red, it's oh, it's, I see. There's a risk. Okay, it's so a it's a problem. So this chart it would say high if there was a real issue, right? Yeah, I'm I'm I was on the wrong chart. I'm sorry. Okay. So I had a question on the risk. Could I just okay. just just could I stick with format for just a second? Because because I, sure. I do I do think this is helpful and does contain the. The, 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 the reporting that you plan to continue to do begins with the executive overview slide, this one. Correct. And includes the successive slides, right? Correct. The next one with the milestones, the next one with the, with the very brief one-line chart and the risk chart. That's Correct. all a package of this reporting that you that plan to do. That would be what right. we would, okay. senior right. leadership on, right. on Rick's team and you, the commission, right. would get that report. Right, okay. And you can certainly have the, the Gantt chart, um, which may change here and there as we, as we tweak it. Um, that's available at a, at, yeah. at a different level of granularity. Well, it's that kind of high-level review that it seemed to me was, was really helpful and, and, and if, if can trigger a need to take a look at the Gantt chart if, right. if we want. But Commissioner McHugh's clarification helped me on this. I thought it was just that one first bar chart, but you're talking more, so that's fine. 
Um, I, I, I had a question on the risks. What, what does the date mean in the column, in that column? When you're logging it or when it's due? So I think that's the date that the risk was logged. This is a this is an issues log, so mm -hmm. it was the date that the issue was put into the log. Right. Right. So um, it might be helpful, at least to me, um, if some of these risks were identified with an end date, I guess, or a, or a due date. Okay. If if the risk is associated with a um, stream that is that has a due date, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll put that in. Some well, cases, I think. Which this one does, for example. Is that what you're talking about? No, that's, Under the, log, that's the log date. That's when they identify No, it says, but it says it needs to be completed by J June 22nd. Oh, the one, yes. But the others might not. Yeah, so we can certainly add a column, Commissioner. And, and probability means what? Low probability of a problem? So I think you, you're basically um, ranking it, and if you were assigning a number of value to high, medium, and low, you could essentially get a, a number for the, the level of the risk. So the probability and the impact are two factors. Um, the probability of it happening and then the impact, of, okay. you know. So it's a In some cases, there may be a high probability of something happening, but. But a low impact. Low impact, right. right. Okay, but I didn't know whether low meant low probability of being a problem or low probability of getting done on time. Low probability of being an issue. Right, got and it. And the impact, I think, okay. is self-explanatory. Right. Okay. Edward is, who, who is, I'm not so familiar Edward with Jordan you. is the project manager mm -hmm. um, for IGT. For IGT. And he's basically, all of these artifacts and materials he has generated and will continue to generate for us. So he maintains the project plan, he's integrated uh, uh, their project plan with what was provided by Penn, mm -hmm. um, and um, he's doing an excellent job of managing the project. And what does the fourth one mean, John? It sounds like uh, casino interruption during go live sounds like a pretty big deal. So we had talked about um, concurrently going live with the startup of the casino. One of the things that is going to have to happen as we put the central management system online is to take down banks of machines, to plug those machines uh, into a fiber connection um, that'll be uh, pre-laid out, and to put those online with the central management system. It will involve um, zeroing the meters on the machines, and it'll have to be a coordinated effort with the, the folks at, at, at Penn. It's just, I think it's an issue we wanted to call out early, um, but it's something that can be worked around with a, with a good plan. Um, okay. It's, it's called a, it's a, it's a reset of the, of the meters, essentially, on each machine. You just read, um, you do it in stages so that the, the casino continues to operate, essentially. Right. I think all of this is done, I mean, both the, the pre-planning of the installation of equipment during their build out of the floor, um, and the way we bring the machines online is to be uh, minimally disruptive to uh, casino operations. That's the way we're working it. Anything else? Questions? Great. All right. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule. I'm going to just take a quick break. Quick break. Thank you. Thank we'll, you. We'll be back in five minutes or so. Okay. We are reconvening at uh, about a little after 11:30. Uh, and we are at item five, the Ombudsman Report, Ombudsman Ziemba. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good uh, morning. First good morning. on my agenda are two items related to Brockton's May 12th casino referendum. Uh, notice to Brockton residents regarding the Commission's suitability process and a waiver of one of the Commission's regulations that governs the timing of certain local votes. Um, at our last Commission meeting, we discussed the Commission requirements related to suitability and the holding of a referendum. Uh, to briefly summarize, uh, the Commission's regulations prohibit the holding of a host community referendum prior to the Commission determining that an applicant is suitable. However, a community can move forward in advance of a suitability determination if a community's governing body votes to do so. Uh, in addition to that vote, a community must engage in a public education campaign to inform its citizens that despite a local vote, an applicant can only apply for a casino license if it has been deemed suitable by the commission. Um, as part of the education 
campaign that's required, a community must send a notice describing the commission's suitability and application process to registered voters. And then finally, uh, pursuant to the commission's regulations, the governing body must first um, a move, uh, vote for, must first vote to move forward with the re referendum before suitability, and only then can actually schedule the referendum. So there's a sequencing in our regulation uh, that's very specific. So first, um, in regard to the notice requirement, uh, Council Blue, Deputy uh, Council Grossman, and I have reviewed the proposed citizen notice that's in your packet, and we've determined that it is consistent with our regulation, that it is uh, substantially similar to notices that have been approved in the past. There have been a number of different notices that have been uh, already done in other parts of the Commonwealth, um, and that it adequately describes the current situation with this applicant. Um, I highlight just one aspect of the notice. Uh, it, it states the historical fact that this applicant, Mass Gaming and Entertainment, has previously been deemed suitable by the Commission. However, the notice also informs Brockton voters that the Commission is currently reviewing any changes, new members, and new circumstances um, since uh, the date of this first uh, prior determination of suitability. Uh, this language was shared with IEB Director Wells, uh, who was uh, okay with this uh, new language. Um, before the Commission considers this notice, I would just like to provide a little bit more context. Um, after discussions with IEB, we propose that the Commission hold a meeting on MG&E's suitability uh, next uh, Wednesday, May 6th. The IEB is currently wrapping up its background investigation um, and should be um, should be prepared by that date. Um, so if the commission determines MG&E suitable on that date, the city of Brockton under our regulation would not need to mail this citizen notice uh, to the voters uh, because uh, the, the proposal would comply with our suitability uh, requirements. Um, sending such a notice uh, despite our uh, positive suitability determination could only cause voter confusion. Uh, although Brockton would not need to mail the notice until after next week, uh, approving the notice now would, uh, would enable Brockton to both print the notices and to prepare them for mailing if it is indeed necessary. Meaning, uh, this, meaning if we don't conclude the suitability on May 6th. Yes, yeah, so there's basically uh, three different categories, and I'm sure there's a million other permutations, but if they're deemed suitable, uh, then there's no need for a notice. Right. If they're deemed not suitable, uh, that's another kettle of fish. A and then uh, the third group would be if there's other additional information that's necessary and the right. com commission cannot make that determination right. next Wednesday and we'd have to have a subsequent vote, then the notice would need to be sent. Right. Okay. I think that those are the three points that it's important for the public to understand, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, the second item is a waiver from the sequencing in the Commission's regulations. Uh, Brockton <coughs> scheduled its election before it voted to move forward with the election in advance of suitability. Uh, this was partly due to uh, the community's efforts to, to meet the Commission's, reg uh, the, to meet the commission's <coughs> uh, then existing deadlines regarding uh, the RFA 2 deadline, which obviously requires that a referendum be completed prior to submitting the RFA 2. Um, as we've noted, that deadline that existed at that time has now uh, since been moved. Um, the Commission has previously entertained and granted a similar waiver in a different community. Uh, pursuant to the Commission's waiver regulations, in order to grant a waiver, the Commission must make uh, certain findings. And, um, and the City of Brockton put forward its arguments on why this waiver request Meets those, um, meets those requirements. Number one, uh, granting the variance is consistent with the purposes of MGL Chapter 23K. Uh, Brockton argues that the, commission, the Commission's measures to protect the integrity of the gaming license process are met, albeit in a different sequence. Uh, this is similar to what we previously uh, ordered and found. Uh, granting the variance will not interfere with the ability of the Commission or the IEB to fulfill its duties because a gaming license remains subject to a positive determination of suitability despite the sequencing. Number three, granting the variance will not adversely affect the public interest 
because the city council does in fact approve holding the election in advance of the final determination of suitability. And finally, not granting the variance would cause substantial hard hardship to the city because it would not be able to proceed with the May 12, uh, 2015 referendum if no suitability decision is, uh, is reached by the commission next week. Uh, with this, I welcome any questions the commission uh, may have, and I think both items would require uh, a vote. Okay. Comments? So we're, uh, we're thinking about two waivers, essentially, or it's one and the, and the same. Yeah, so one is it's not a waiver, but uh, it's an exception that is built into our regulations, and what the commission would be approving is the notice that has been uh, uh, reviewed okay. by, That's the first by Council, action. myself, and, uh, and Director Wells. That may or may not go out depending on what happens next week. That's exactly right. And then the second matter is a waiver to our regulation regarding how the sequencing occurred, whereby they voted first to uh, schedule the election and then uh, move forward on the vote to move forward in advance of suitability. Yes. Both of those, the, the need for both of those is uh, mooted if we find MGE suitable. That is, that is correct. And, and the first one, the approval of the notice um, is today, say, is designed to allow the printing and contingency planning that's necessary to go forward if there's a problem next Wednesday. Exactly right. But, the sec but w w why is that also true of the second one? In other words, why couldn't we, if we find either uh, the need to get more information or find that there is a lack of suitability why couldn't we decide on the variance um, then? We could definitely do that. Um, uh, the city has raised no objections to that. They didn't know about this request, but in thinking right. about it right. uh, uh, over the last day, I don't believe that that would be an obstacle. It, 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 and I raise that because it seems to me that, that the, um, I know it makes the, uh, the timeline shorter and, and makes the heart palpitations the greater, I suppose, by making it shorter. But it also seems to me that the, uh, at least some of the four conditions um, if uh, uh, might be affected by what we do next Wednesday if we were to determine that there's not suitability, uh, that we couldn't make the suitability determination on Wednesday. For example, if we determine that uh, there's a lack of suitability that conditions uh, that we have to find in order to grant a waiver um, uh, would would be different from um, our assessment of the conditions if we said we needed more information, I think. Right. So it'd be very hard today to say that the four conditions from, uh, I think, to say that the four conditions are met when we when we uh, know we're going to have this hearing next Wednesday. So, so I guess I would be in favor of, of uh, voting today on the first one, but not on the second one. I would think on the, the sequencing, if we're just talking about the sequencing, it is, it, it's a little bit of a different matter of the general uh, consideration we take a look at from suitability and, and that if we're specific to the sequencing, um, the waiver request is in order, but one benefit of potentially uh, not doing it until next week is that if no waiver is otherwise required, um, then there would be no, uh, no one could point to the fact that a waiver was necessary to move forward with the, right. uh, with the election. Right. I, I don't have a problem. I mean, so it, it seems. Like you're agreeing with Commissioner McHugh. Yeah, I, I think uh, either way we could probably, uh, if indeed uh, there's positive suitability next week, this could be a non-issue. Um, uh, otherwise, we could probably deal with it quickly um, on next Wednesday. Is I don't there know any, if council has any objections that we could. Is there any downside to doing it next Wednesday? This to, provides to, a lot to, more certainty to the to the community right. that um, what they have done uh, pursuant to our regulations is is, is uh, right. in order and. Uh, uh, it lessens uh, some of the anxiety, as Commissioner McHugh uh, noted. Right. Just, just a, a small technical <coughs> question, question uh, to protect the city of Brockton. Would their printing costs uh, 
be covered by the uh, by the applicant as part of the overall cost of the election. Yeah, pursuant Whether to our regulation, those costs are borne by the applicant. Okay. So, give me an give me an example of the the two. How the benefit of postponing this to next week? What are the different conditions that might make us not grant the waiver under one set and maybe grant it under another? Condition number three is whether the waiver would adversely, granting the waiver would adversely affect the public interest. If we found uh, a lack of suitability, perhaps a curable lack of suitability, but a lack of suitability, uh, it seems to me uh, that factor might be decided differently than if we found that more information was necessary in order to make a suitability determination. But they would still need to go forward with the referendum in either situation. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah. But, uh, but we might not. We, uh, I think this is entirely hypothetical. But, yeah. but we might not be so willing to grant the waiver if we found a lack of suitability, as we would be, if we found that simply more information were necessary in order to make the suitability determination. But if, if it was a lack of suitability, then it's over, right? No, the not, ball game is over. Not, not necessarily. I mean, we could find the lack of suitability, but you, somehow you have to remove somebody, or you have to do something, or you can cure the lack of suitability. But until you've done it, we're not prepared to make the final suitability determination. So they, so they wouldn't have been found unsuitable. Right. They would, we would have said, we can't you'll make be suitable conditional on something or other, probably. Right. right. And then the what the, what the what what it is that you have to do may affect how we look at um, the overall suitability determination. I mean the uh, the, we, the uh, waiver determination. But if if we were if we were giving them what would in effect be a conditional suitability, you you can be suitable if you do A, B, and C. We would presumably not do that. We, we would want the referendum to go forward. We wouldn't want to. Suspend so, so, suppose, suppose we. Uh, I, I realize that this is hypothetical, and and but I just uh, and I'm raising it uh, uh, for a for purposes of discussion yeah. and b to ensure that we uh, take this um, uh, uh, waiver decision um, uh, carefully as we have in the past. We could say that you have to get a new uh, somebody or something to perform a function in this uh, organization before we will find you, be able to find you suitable. And uh, until you know who this uh, entity is, um, you can't, you, it seems to me you might not be able to find that the waiver's in the public interest. I realize this is a hypothetical, now on a hypothetical, but isn't, isn't that possibility lessened by the fact that we already found suitable the two parties that have come into partnership? Probably is. I mean, it's just a weighing against whatever the likelihood of that right. possibility versus the, you know, the uncertainty for, for the participants at this point. And I don't feel terribly strongly about either one of them, but it sort of feels like it is a hypothetical and it's sufficiently hypothetical that maybe it's not worth worrying about. It's certainly worth talking about because I had thought about this consequence, but I'm not sure that it's worth not giving them the certainty of the right to go forward. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm thinking that, um, oh, I'm, I didn't let, let you finish on that. No, no, last it, if they're found unsuitable, this is all moot. The whole thing is yes. moot, right? But if they're found unsuitable, this whole thing is moot. But assuming right. that they aren't, um, I'm not sure that we don't want to give them the comfort that they'll be able to go forward with the referendum. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Plus, the the waiver, as I understand it, is on sequence, part of which has already happened, <coughs> um, isn't it? I mean, they, they already scheduled the referendum. That's correct. Yes, the, the sequence has been reversed, but they have already scheduled the referendum prior right. to voting to go ahead without suitability. Without, so they're right. asking for the waiver on the sequence. Right. And that's information that, you know, we could act on today. Well, that's sort of a self-wielding sword, though, right? I'm sorry? 
that, that that's a condition that they created themselves. Correct. Right. Hence a waiver request, right? We need the waiver. Be yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just trying to understand better the uncertainty. We'll have great certainty after the suitability next Wednesday, uh, after the hearing. Um, we got to get our so state. That, we got to get our state troopers to figure out. <laughs> Mr. Carney, wake up. Is it his phone? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I think there's always uncertainty until the hearing, right, for any suitability hearing. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand this additional uncertainty. Well, the, the uncertainty is whether or not they'll be permitted to go ahead with the referendum if but, we don't find them unsuitable. But I think what we're saying is with with suitability they'll they'll be able to do that so i guess i'm not understanding the uncertainty well no because Com commissioner McHugh is is hypothesizing that there could be a situation i don't quite see it but there could be a situation where they are conditionally suitable um but that we might choose to want to say to them we're not going to let you have the referendum until this is Resolved. That's, I guess that's what we would have to be saying, right? We're going to say you're going to have to cancel the referendum until you mm -hmm. become suitable. I, I, it's the only, that's the only hypothetical I can actually play out. Yeah. What, what they don't, but we'll know is the the point of the sequencing in our regulation was to, designed to avoid a conflict between um, election law, which states that once an election has been called, uh, it is at least uh, very difficult, if not prohibited, to, to stop that election. Right. In our regulation, which says that you cannot move forward in advance um, without the prior vote, and that's why we have that sequencing in our in our regulation. So, in any regard, uh, potentially, the election would need to go forward regardless of whether or not it satisfies the requirements of our license. Which, so, the election which, could be a, a basically a nullity for the purposes of. Um, meeting our requirements for I mean, our so you'd have the election, but it wouldn't be binding on us? Potentially. Yeah, potentially, that's correct. You'd have to have the election? Um, in our we conversations went, we with the Secretary of State's before, office right? in the past, right. they said that there's no uh, authority to recall an election once it has been scheduled, yeah. which is the purpose of our sequencing right. regulation. On, on that note, I'm, I'm more inclined to ag agree on the waiver today uh, because the waiver is on you know the, uh, a part of it is an important part of it is on that sequence again that has already taken place um, and provide whatever uh, certainty that may additionally to the public interest well I am too if, if we can't schedule if we can't stop the election then we could then my we hypothetical I mean my hypothetical is a risk avoidance kind of problem, but uh, I don't think the risk is highly probable. It just seemed to me that it was better to wait and see if the risk disappeared entirely before we made this decision. I, did in the past, did the, did the applicant come to us before they'd scheduled the election? Didn't they? Um, yes. I mean, we, right. we have yeah. they, back they, and forth. They asked for the waiver and then yeah. they scheduled the election. Instead uh, they, of scheduling the election, well, no, no, no. The, for the, in the past incident, um, the the, the waiver that was previously granted in the city of Boston, uh, there was a scheduling of the referendum prior to the it vote. Was, it was, it was the same thing as this. It was the same thing as this, and we granted that waiver in the past. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not unhappy that we had the discussion, but I don't, I don't agree with my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> well, as usual, you've got us to think about things that none of us have thought about right. before. But not as usual, we're gonna ignore it. <laughs> 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 Me too. <laughs> All right. Um, I just wanted to say for the record that I think everybody, including the city of Brockton and the participant and the applicant, owe Director Wells and the IEB a, a vote of appreciation because although we did not have to have the suitability background check completed or the decision made prior to the election, 
um, they felt strongly that it's in the public interest to do that. So they have moved heaven and earth to try to get this suitability check. Moving heaven and earth means a lot of people staying at the office on the weekends and working late at nights and so forth. And they just, they really refuse to, if it's possible, to get this done in advance of the referendum. The IEV, IEB said we will make this happen. So for the record, I think we, we owe them an appreciation. And not just the IEB, but others like yeah. John here as well. Right. Okay. Um, any more discussion? We will have a motion on one or more. Do we have to do them in sequence? Uh, yes. I, w I would do the waiver first and then the notice. Okay. And because the notice requires the specific findings. I mean, excuse me. The, the, waiver, the waiver requires, requires the specific, specific findings, findings, yes. Somebody want to move the waiver? Sure. I'd be happy to move that uh, this commission approve the waiver request from the city of Brockton as presented here. Uh, in the packet and discussed here today. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Ayes have it unanimously. I would further move, Mr. Chairman, that uh, this commission approve the citizens' notice as uh, from the city of Brockton as presented here uh, in the packets today. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. And I take it that the first vote that we uh, took uh, implicit in, in our approval uh, of that first vote is a finding that all four conditions necessary for the, uh, for the uh, granting of the waiver have been met. I just take yes. it. Yes. I'm just yeah. observing that I take it that that's implicit in that uh, vote. Good point. That is, thank you. Okay. Next up. All right, great. <laughs> next item. Uh, next week, uh, we begin the local community advisor, mitigation advisory committee uh, meetings for both Region A. Uh, they will have their first meetings ne next week. Uh, these meetings will primarily be operational in focus, establishing how and when uh, the members of these committees uh, will meet. Uh, over the last month, month and a half, uh, Gordon Carr and I met with uh, local designees who will be attending this uh, meeting uh, in order to discuss the, the role of the, the committees and uh, our timetable and what we're hoping to get out of these, uh, these committees. Um, what we discussed is one of the primary roles of, of these committees, uh, primary role of these committees would, to, would be to help the commission establish its community mitigation fund policies uh, in 2016 and, and thereafter. Um, we noted that um, pursuant to the, the Gaming Act, these local committees are designed to be in existence for uh, basically the next 17 years or so, uh, the next couple years of the construction period and the entire term of the Category 1 licenses. So, um, you know, as they say, every great journey begins with the first step and uh, next week uh, we begin this very innovative process that the, that the legislature has designed to help communities achieve and the commission achieve uh, the, the goals of the Expanded Gaming Act, namely to uh, reach the benefits, the economic and other benefits of the act while mitigating or minimizing negative uh, circumstances. So we're very excited about um, uh, this, next, um, this next beginning. Uh, Given this uh, context, I, I recommend that the commission uh, over the next several months uh, and certainly in the near future discuss um, questions that it may have regarding uh, how the community mitigation fund in future years should be constructed. Uh, as you know, we, we issued guidelines in December for this year's program. Um, and what we have told these uh, local committee members is that we very much want to want to receive their advice as we go forward into the, into the next year program. Uh, in many ways, uh, the first year community, community mitigation fund program um, will just set the table for future programs, which will undoubtedly be uh, much more expansive. Uh, as, as everyone knows, uh, this year no facility was in operation at the time that we started the Community Mitigation Fund program for the 2015, um, and there was no significant construction going on regarding the two uh, Category 1 facilities. But uh, that is not likely the case for this next upcoming season and thereafter. 
So uh, in that context, in some of those one-on-one -on -one discussions, uh, we discuss a, a, a lot of uh, questions that perhaps the commission could get some advice from these committees on. And you know, so I'll just give you some of the examples uh, as, as we promised when we established the Community Mitigation Fund guidelines. Uh, one of the discussions uh, that we had was uh, when should the fund be available for operational impacts? Um, our first licensee pen uh, will be operational come June 24th, um, but our full casino licenses still are at least a couple of years away. And so when we begin looking at the 2016 fund, uh, what do we do about operational impacts? Uh, one other question would be, should funds be used to address known impacts uh, that are occurring, or should we consider uh, predicted impacts, impacts that may occur in the future? Uh, during the whole uh, surrounding community negotiations, communities and the commission uh, and applicants uh, we're making a, a range of predictions about potential impacts, and those were memorialized in the surrounding community agreements. Uh, the 2015 Community Mitigation Fund program is predicated upon actual impacts that are being experienced or were experienced. But some communities have made the case that, uh, the, that uh, the Community Mitigation Fund should be expanded uh, to include uh, predicted uh, impacts because some things that uh, namely transportation projects take many years to plan and by the time that you would be experiencing the impact uh, or a more severe impact uh, you might be years behind if you, if you wait until that date. Um, however on the other side of that coin uh, there, there are issues such as uh, the surrounding community agreements made a number of predictions. Uh, should we be utilizing funds for impacts that are just not knowable with any certainty. Uh, if, if you require a certainty bar, how certain does one need to be before you fund a particular project? These are all thorny issues that can be discussed at these committees. Uh, and then one of the other uh, issues that this commission has taken a look at in the past would be how do we construct the fund? Uh, currently the fund is for Region A, Region B, and also for slots uh, impacts. Uh, the, in the future, after the uh, full casinos in, are, are in operation, each of them will contribute an, annually as a portion of their gaming taxes to this fund. And should there be an allocation by region of, of how these funds should be allocated um, with, the, with the, a certain set off uh, for the slots related impacts, or should it just be one general um, fund for all communities? So these are, these are some of the issues that I think that uh, we'll ask these advisory committees, the local committees, and then in the future there's another, uh, it's called the Community Mitigation Subcommittee to the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee. Uh, that will also help us uh, analyze some of these policy issues so that when we come around to making our choices for 2016 and thereafter, uh, we'll make good decisions. One thing that we've noted in these one-on-one -on -one meetings is that um, we have the benefit of the fact that our full casinos are not going to be operational for a couple of years because uh, any predicted impacts on operational will at least have a couple of years to think about them uh, and their applicability to the fund um, uh, at these committee discussions. And so by the time they, uh, they are operational, we can you know, hopefully have a little bit more uh, debate. Questions, thoughts? Well, those are all excellent um, policy questions, but yeah. you know, look forward to the discussion from those committees, which is the intention of the legislation. Right. I think you and uh, Gordon Carr have done a great job on on getting substantive stuff in front of these committees, so they're not just going to be showcase show committees. They'll actually have an opportunity to be substantive and help us, which is great. Yeah, they should be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thoughtful analysis. Next up, General Counsel Blue.
control regulations and we have deputy general counsel grossman and mr band to discuss those with you good afternoon good afternoon i have before you uh, once again a copy of the internal controls draft we've incorporated um, a number of the changes discussed at your last meeting which uh, were largely derived from the MGM comment letter. Um, happy to go through some of those with you. Uh, they're all the changes in the draft that are in purple uh, to reflect just the changes from last meeting. If that would be seems, helpful. Yeah, yeah, it seems to me that you've captured the, the things that were in the MGM letter and the things that we talked about, particularly the, the uh, at least to my memory, the. Um, uh, the uh, 138026B uh, uh, insertion of, an, uh, of a carve out for uh, the, the credit regulations, uh, making them not susceptible to the waiver pr process that's there. That, as usual, was well done and thoughtfully, thoughtfully crafted. So. I think that all the, all the other purples are things we've discussed and things that came out of the letter. The only thing we didn't change that was uh, recommended by MGM were some of the staffing levels for some of the table games. Right. Um, those we left as they were. Um, it was our judgment that those numbers uh, would result in adequate staffing. So we didn't, that was the only thing we didn't change. In the main, MGM was requesting fewer. Fewer, yes. Yeah, I, I think particularly as a startup, uh, it's always easier to decrease when things are running smoothly. But as a startup, as we have been warned many times, uh, there are more things to be looked at and more people to watch um, than may be so later on when everybody's up to speed. So that's something we can always revisit later. Do anybody want highlights on any of this? Do I've I've had the uh, I've had that highlight before, and I've read through these. So okay. I, 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 not on my account. Anybody else? Do we ready to go ahead? All right. Do you want to have a motion? Sure. I'd be uh, happy to move that. Well, at what stage are we in here to make them? Uh, this is the final the approval. Final We've had a hearing, so we would ask that you approve them for a final promulgation. I think we brought the amended small business impact statement to you before. Um, so I think a vote that includes both the amended small business impact statement, which I noticed we don't have in the package, but I think had in a prior package, um, unless it's farther down. But no, I think it was last. Is it, last is it farther year. down? Okay. I think it was approved. Yeah, I think it was, think it was already election. approved on this one. So if you would yep. just vote to approve the regulations for a final promulgation, yep. we will take them and file them. Perfect. We just ask, I'm sorry, with the, with the uh, flexibility to make any citation yes. and grammatical type adjustments needed as we go through it one final time. <laughs> Duly noted. I would then move that um, this commission approve the uh, regulations 205 CMR 138 uh, for final promulgation. Uh, those are the regulations for the uniform standards of accounting procedures and internal controls as uh, submitted here uh, in the packet with the caveats for uh, typographical um, corrections. Citations. And citations, and, and, and the right citations, yes. Second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. I, I think it's appropriate to observe that this um, uh, set of regulations really um, uh, is uh, highly detailed and uh, very well executed, and I also think that the that the um, promulgation process that um, the legal department under Mr. Uh, Grossman and Mr. Bond's uh, 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 supervision uh, did a terrific job of soliciting both informally before we started the formal promulgation process and then throughout the formal promulgation process comments from all uh, interested stakeholders 
explaining those comments, thinking about those comments, incorporating the fruits of those comments in the regulations. And as a consequence, we have a set of regulations that I think really has been thoroughly vetted. Uh, not everybody's going to agree with every detail in them, but that's the way things are. But the process, I think, was exemplary, particularly in this uh, highly technical but critically important area uh, that gets us a, a firm foundation for our regulatory regime. So uh, I thank you both, and I thank everybody who participated in this for the thoughtful work you put into getting us here. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate I, that. I couldn't agree more, and that includes our licensees and a lot of their yes. thoughtful read. Right. Um, but, but certainly, you know, the Attorney General's office and a lot of the staff here. So right. I, I echo that. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next before you is a um, briefing I want to give you on some litigation that we have, and then I would like to ask for a delegation of authority to address some of the claims in that litigation. So in December of 2014, the group known as Protection of Working Animals and Handlers, which I will refer to as POWA, filed a suit against the commission. The suit alleged that the commission, in its role as the racing commission, should have paid certain monies from the racing stabilization fund to POWA members, and that certain outs payments collected by the commission should be deposited into the racing stabilization fund. POWA as a group represents Greyhound owners, lessees, and kennel owners. And the racing stabilization fund is the fund that was created by statute to provide monies to the owners of Greyhounds once the Greyhound racing was prohibited in the Commonwealth. So the complaint has two main claims. The first was that payments for the period of April 1st, 2011 through April 1st of 2012 should have been made and were not made. And that the outs payments for the years 2013 and the first half of 2014 should be deposited in the racing stabilization fund now. And the reason that that's a, a question is because the Racing Stabilization Fund also has a finite end, which was June 30th of 2014. No payments should be made out of the fund after that date. Payments for the 2011-2012 period were not made because the Office of Consumer Affairs, which was the agency at the time that was overseeing the racing matters, believed that the change in the statute that said the payment should not be made for that period meant that the payments could never be made, as opposed to viewing that as a moratorium on payments. This, this was going on at the time when the legislature was considering the Expanded Gaming Act and was working on the 2011 Act that was ultimately passed. The 2013 and 2014 outs payments were not scheduled to be deposited into the Racing Stabilization Fund. We are just now receiving the 2013 outs payments because we received those 90 days after one year after the year in which they occur. Um, outs from 2014 will be received by the Commission in the first quarter of 2016. We have just sent out the invoice for the outs for 2013. I met with the Council for Power to discuss these claims. I asked for a legal memorandum from her describing um, her view on the issue of the moratorium of the 2011-2012 payments. I also further reviewed the decision issued by the court in prior litigation filed by Power regarding the 2009 outs payments. You may recall in 2009, Power filed a suit trying to collect the 2009 outs payments, and the court decided that the commission did, in fact, they should be in the racing stabilization fund, and we did, in fact, make those payments. After review and discussion, it is my recommendation that the commission, with the assistance of the Attorney General's office, enter into settlement discussions with Power to resolve these claims. The statute that discussed the payments in 2011 and 2012 is not clear as to whether the payment should never be made at all or whether this was just a moratorium for that period. When you review that statutory language in the context of the legislature's intention to provide support to Greyhound owners, kennel owners, and lessees, the legislature's actions at the time in passing and implementing the Expanded Gaming Act, the requirements that the commission deposit outs collected during that period into the Racing Stabilization Fund, and then the finite period of payments out of that fund, it makes more sense to read the statute to require that the payments be suspended during that period and that payments be made once the commission was up and running, the gaming commission was up and running, and could take over the racing stabilization fund. I think it's important to note that the collection of those payments during that period continued, so there was no 
no legislative action to stop the collection of the payments. Further, the judge's decision in the Powell litigation on the 2009 outs payment was clear that the outs payments become outs payments in the year that they occur, as not the year in which they are collected. So that's the timing that determines whether they are deposited in the Racing Stabilization Fund. Based on that decision, outs payments collected in 2013 should be deposited into the fund, and outs payments collected in the first half of 2014 should be deposited into the fund and used to calculate the payments due out to power. Outs payments for the balance of 2014 and beyond will also be deposited into the fund, but the Commission's obligation to make payments out of the fund ceases as of June 30th, 2014. And just by way of background, the payments, the money that is collected and the payments, the way the payments are calculated use two different formulas. So the outs and the breaks are collected and put into the fund, but the payments out of the fund are based upon a percentage of the total wager on Greyhound simulcasting. Thus, the deposits in and the payments out don't necessarily match, but the Commission is never required to pay out more than what they have collected. So it makes for an, um, kind of an interesting fund to manage. I am asking the Commission to delegate to me and the Executive Director the authority to work with the Attorney General's office to enter into an agreement to resolve these claims by making the payments that were due out of the 2011 and 2012 period and depositing the 2013 and the outs for the first half of 2014 into the stabilization fund and to use those to calculate the payments due to power. Once these payments are made, they will be the final payments due to Greyhound owners, kennel owners, and lessees. I will ask the Attorney General's office to have the court approve any settlement agreement and enter an order dismissing the case with prejudice, prejudice once the payments have been made. So if there are any questions. So the, the fund is still in, in existence and receiving funding, right? The Racing yes. Stabilization Fund. Um, what went away on July of 2014 was um, the mandate for this commission to, to, pay, make, the to make those payments. Yes, that's right. So the money will still be deposited in there, but the payments out of the fund ended on June 30th of 2014. Right, right. But that, that fund itself will not necessarily, will not expire on, unless there's some legislative action. That's correct. And the legislation says that the fund cannot be used for any other purposes. So the fund will continue to collect those payments and it will on, stay in place. Until the legislature decides to do something with it. That's right. Uh, General Counsel Blue, do you, I, first of all, I've had a chance to discuss this and I agree with your recommendation. It makes sense. Um, but the, um, the monies coming in, is that something we should make the legislature aware of, that this is still collecting, <coughs> although there's no obligation to get the monies out? Is that something, have we thought about that? Um, we have. As, as you may recall, we will be due to provide the legislature with recommendations yes. on the racing statute in general, and so I think the best way is to probably fold that into that mm -hmm. potential redraft of the racing statute. Mm -hmm. The racing statute will sunset again in 2016. How much money is it a year, more or less? Um, the balance, a, a year I can't tell. The balance in the fund now is right. about 693000 and it includes the money collected for that period between 2011 and 2012. The last outs payment that um, you approved was, I want to say, about 170000 somewhere in there. Okay. I'm not going to fix the MBTA. No. No. Okay. Questions? Do we, do we need to vote on this to authorize you and, and Director Day? To delegate the authority right. to us to enter into settlement discussions and settle the matter. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the Commission delegate the authority to uh, the Executive Director and General Counsel to uh, move forward with uh, the settlement of this agreement with, do we call them POA or? I call them POA. I thought it was a new branch of the Wampanoags we were looking at here. <laughs> Second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have two regulations, uh, 205 CMR 139 and 205 CMR 140. Both of these regulations were before you at the last meeting. We have the um, amended small business impact statements with them as well. 
Deputy General Counsel Grossman will speak to you about some potential changes to 139. We didn't receive any comments on 140, but we did get some comments on 139, and there are some uh, potential matters that we would like you to consider and provide us with guidance. Okay. On uh, 139, as, as you are aware, governs uh, largely the financial and compliance type reporting by the gaming uh, licensees to the Commission on a regular basis, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annual, or anywhere in that uh, range. By and large, we have laid out in these regulations a number of the statutory reporting requirements um, contained in Chapter 23K for ease of reference, so everyone is aware of what the, the reports uh, are. There are certainly some elements of this that we included on our own, a number of which are fairly common in the gaming industry. Things like uh, the reporting of uh, audit and compliance committee uh, minutes and uh, things of that nature, tax returns. Um, there are a couple of minor, uh, they're not minor, but there are a couple of uh, small uh, changes that as a staff we would recommend to uh, reflect uh, some of the Commission's ongoing concerns with uh, minority women and uh, veteran uh, businesses and make sure that we uh, more thoroughly account for those statistics. So on, um, and I don't think this is in the draft that we circulated. This came about more recently, but there are just uh, two changes on page two of the draft and going on to page three. It's uh, A, B, and we're in section 13903, A, B, and C. Uh, we would recommend including language um, to expand those reports to include race, gender, uh, and veteran status uh, in A, uh, to expand B to include that the annual report be submitted at other times directed by the commission in the event that you have an interest in seeing those uh, details on a more regular basis. Um, and on C to include uh, veteran status as well. So that's a quarterly report. It already includes uh, gender and race and we'd recommend you include veteran status uh, in that one as well. So those are um, some of the more technical changes that we would uh, recommend to this draft. There was uh, a comment submitted on behalf of MGM by Brown Rudnick that gets into more overarching concerns with this reporting section. And uh, by and large, it deals with the confidentiality and sensitive nature of some of this information. And again, much of it is mandated to be uh, transmitted to the commission by statute. Uh, but they have raised what appear to be some legitimate concerns with some of this information. Um, and it's uh, important, I think, that we think about this now, of course, before uh, we go down the road of ex uh, taking in the information um, or having uh, licensees tell us they're not comfortable giving it to us. So uh, here we are, it's kind of come to a, a head with this, even though a lot of this, again, is statutory. And I, I think it uh, is, uh, warrants a, a discussion about the Commission's views, and this might not be for today necessarily, since this came about fairly recently, but the Commission's general views on the sensitivity of, of uh, some of this information, and a lot of it, again, is laid out in the letter. And to the extent that you uh, determine that some of this is uh, sensitive information, what tools we have to um, address that under the public records law and otherwise. Uh, and there are a, a couple of tools uh, potentially at your disposal. There is the general public records law that um, applies to all records that we receive. Uh, and it has 20 some odd uh, exemptions and there are a number of exemptions that may apply on a case by case basis to some of this information. Um, there is um, an investigatory exemption. There is an exemption that covers things like blueprints and public safety type concerns. Um, 
but a lot of this stuff wouldn't necessarily fit into any uh, neatly anyway into any uh, exception exemption to the general public records law. There is a statutory exemption to the public records law. It's exemption A, that basically says that if there is any statute outside of the public records law that addresses uh, certain documents and allows them to be exempted from public disclosure, that they are also exempt from disclosure under the public records law. And uh, as MGM raises in their uh, letter, there is language in chapter 23K, section 21, it's in uh, paragraph A7, that talks about documents uh, received by the commission as part of gaming-related investigations. And so the first question is uh, what you would consider to be a gaming-related investigation. If you, and there are a number of different ways of looking at that. Um, it could be looked at narrowly as investigations that are initiated about a specific incident um, and any documents or uh, information that's gleaned as a result of that specific information would be all that would be covered by this particular section. Or it could be uh, looked at a little more broadly in which uh, we consider to, uh, suitability and compliance and things like that to be an ongoing uh, investigatory matter that the IEB is engaged in, that the commission is interested in. So that's, I think, one of the threshold uh, questions before you as far as this particular uh, exemption would be concerned is how broadly or narrowly you would uh, define what a gaming-related investigation uh, to be. And once that decision is made, uh, there is authority in uh, this section of Chapter 23K that would allow the Commission to enter into uh, non disclosure agreements for certain information. And that's one tool that may be potentially at your disposal to address some of these financial uh, and compliance type uh, reports that we. Uh, discuss in section 139 of these regulations before you. And I should add that I think a lot of this discussion here actually overlaps with um, some of the internal control uh, documents that uh, are required under the uh, regulations you just approved. Um, and with that, I think maybe I should take a pause and just uh, uh, say that I think this is an issue that we should uh, address before these regulations are adopted. Um, and as uh, General Counsel Blue pointed out, these regulations are fully teed up for adoption. They've been through the whole process. Uh, they've gone through a public hearing. I believe Commissioner Stebbins presided over that last week. Um, so they're ready to go whenever you are comfortable uh, with their content. Well. Um, I, I, for one, would like to, um, you know, un understand perhaps a few more examples of what um, MGM would consider um, sensitive information that we are now requiring as a matter of course under these draft regulations. Um, yeah. They list a whole bunch of them. Well, yes. I There's think. audit committee uh, meetings, uh, yeah. minutes. There are. Uh, minutes of the directors where they discuss uh, future plans. There are financial reports, uh, projections, uh, uh, projections uh, that may change uh, that are n not part of the uh, material the SEC requires to be released. It, there's, it seems to me there's a host of stuff in there that falls into this category and, and uh, um, that, they, that they do have and, and all, all these entities um, have a, a significant interest in not being made public. I, yes, and, and I guess that's uh, part of where I, what I was trying to uh, articulate is I, I think the way we drafted these regulations was very exhaustive uh, to include all of those items uh, that we might now need to think about a second, a second time um, and think about the, the purpose for those you know, ultimately, what what are we uh, gaining marginally on 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 these reports? As a matter of course, um, I I think access to 
to this information may be crucial, but ultimately receiving a lot of this information as a matter of course may may not be necessary. I'm, I'm, I'm purely speculating here, but I'd like to think that it might not be all is, is, is another potential tool uh, the requirement that reports be prepared uh, and maintained by the licensee in a form that we prescribe and made available to us uh, on uh, demand so that we could, for example, uh, have a periodic, uh, periodically have a team go to the licensee's premises, review the materials, uh, summarize them for compliance with our reporting requirements to the legislature, but not physically take custody of them unless and until the information in them was made public, such as in the annual reports that uh, or quarterly reports, or uh, 10Ks that, uh, that the companies file with the SEC or otherwise distribute to the public. I think that's yes. right. I think that is an option for some things. I think the commission, though, would have to make a finding um, that that type of process would satisfy what the statute in a number of places refers to as providing the commission with certain reports. Um, so we would have to determine that access to the information is the same as being provided with the information, essentially. And the statute uses different terminology in different places. But I think that could be um, one way to address uh, some of these, these issues. Um, to do that, I think, uh, would require us to go through all of the reports and make a determination as to which reports need to be just made uh, accessible to us and which ones we actually want submitted uh, to us, unless you decide just all of them should be made um, available. So that's, that's I think, a more complex exercise, um, but I think absolutely that is an option on the table. Although I, I'll have to, I would just uh, say that the public records law says that um, any documents that are received by an agency are, are presumptively public records. So, and I, I didn't find any case law or otherwise on the question as to whether looking at documents on a portal or something like that would be considered receiving documents. So that might be an area of the law that's somewhat unsettled, although it appears as though if we don't actually receive something, then we wouldn't have the document, but that could be a concern. We have, we have looked a little bit at that issue, and in, um, Mr. Grossman is correct. It is unsettled to some degree whether if you have access to something, easy access to something, whether that constitutes receiving the document. I think the question of going out to visit the licensee and looking at something works. We would have to be careful with how we brought that information back, because once we summarize that information, that could potentially then be a public record in our possession, but we have control over how that is summarized. Um, you know, some, some of these things could be dealt with in terms of timing. So for example, documents that do become public from the licensee at a certain point in time, you know, we, we may be able to receive those and they're fine and that addresses the licensee's concern but gives us information that we, we want. Um, there are some things that are in fact covered by statute. So one of the issues raised here was about tax returns. Tax returns are kept out of the public records by federal statute. So there are some things where other, when that statutory exemption in our Commonwealth public records law do apply. Um, the other groups of documents are much as Mr. Grossman has described, whether it would be sufficient to have them available to go out, create some kind of summary and bring it back, or whether we determine we really need to have that provided to us if it is provided to us, it is very likely to be a public record. We have some confidentiality, non-disclosure language in our regs that's possible to work on that, um, but some of that, we would have to consider then individual requests as they came in, and if we're getting a lot of documents over time, that could be a, a somewhat cumbersome process. Well, it also is a process that's not, I mean, none of our regulations can override the statute. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the public records law is, is an interpretation of that is in the hands of others. Um, so we can, we can make judgments, but um, that is pretty broad 
and the exemptions, uh, f <coughs> legitimately, the exemptions are construed narrowly. So we, we, we have, we, have, have we made any effort to match what our statutory requirements provide with um, the routine reporting that the licensees, at least the, they're all public companies, uh, with what they're required to do. In other words, have we, have we tried to see how much of our reporting could piggyback on reporting that they're already required to do? Not that I'm aware of. Well, you'd be the one to know. Yeah. Well, I, well. Uh, the answer is no. I yeah. mean, I have not done that type of uh, analysis. I, I have looked at it a little bit. I, I don't think that what's publicly required is as broad as what we're asking for. So in terms of publicly available financials, that covers a chunk of what we're looking for. But when you're looking for things like minutes um, and just particularly things like audit reports and audit responses, well, are, they, are they statutorily required? Audit reports, minutes? Those well, we've required them in the regulation no. in the minutes, yes. No, I, don't I, know I know that. They're not statutorily uh, required. No. There no. are other things like I, complementary reports that, right. you yes, know, that are. are statutorily required. So it seems to me, but if we look at categories, it seems to me that there are things that they're statutorily required to provide to us. Then there are things um, that uh, we are independently requiring. And then we have the public records law, and we have some of the things that they, that we're requiring from them that are statutorily secret, like the tax returns. And there are other things uh, that um, we might be able to um, s satisfy our needs and the statutory needs uh, by relying on reports that they make elsewhere. So it seems to me that yep. th this, is, this is important enough to take the time necessary to perform a, a, a more finely grained analysis. Because I really do think that if, if we got um, information uh, provided to us that was, um, uh, that affected the uh, plans of the company in a way that was not disclosed elsewhere, um, there could be uh, immediate and dramatic mm -hmm. impacts on the stock that, that we, we wouldn't want to uh, precipitate. Well, That's you right. haven't yes. discussed the investigative uh, exemption here. All of these reports would, uh, or at least the majority, would be, uh, would be headed to IEB, right? It's very similar to the suitability, and it would be part of ongoing suitability, and much of that data was redacted right. because of the investigation. Why would that be different now? Well, there is, there is a blanket Question. exemption in the statute for information we received as part of applications, the RFA2 application, mm -hmm. so we were able to utilize that. That doesn't apply now because we're through the application process. So this information is a little bit different. But, yeah. but Commissioner Cameron is bringing a point more on the phase one, or the suitability. Phase one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you yeah. had per a lot of personal information, which right. there's a specific exemption for. There's the investigatory exemption. That's, um, that's so what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, I think that's, that, is, that is right. Um, if you agree that some or all of this is part of an ongoing investigation, then uh, it gives us more flexibility to uh, utilize some exemptions. And I think uh, to pick up on Commissioner McHugh's comment about others making judgments, I think the exemptions are narrowly defined and have been uh, litigated to some degree um, when it comes to the express statutory exemptions. When it comes to the uh, statutory exemptions, so we would be looking at our own statute, Chapter 23K, I think you probably have a little more discretion and there'd be more deference when it comes to you interpreting Chapter 23K, Section 21A7, what that means and how you're going to apply it. And at the end of the day, it, it's still true that others would have uh, the final say on, on what that means, but I think in that regard, you would have uh, more discretion. So yeah, if you're inclined to go down that road, uh, we could devise um, a, a system 
under which perhaps uh, the uh, gaming licensees come to you and say, here are these reports. And we should preface everything by saying they're, they're at no point in here do they say they will not provide anything to us. It's not us looking at it that there's any concern with. It's them becoming public. Um, that they provide the reports subject to a non-disclosure agreement. So under that approach, we don't at the moment need to go through and figure out exactly which reports uh, are likely to contain confidential or sensitive information. That would be left to each of the gaming licensees to approach you and say, here's this report. It has this information in it. We believe that it's a, a trade secret or its release would be detrimental to our interest under this exemption. We'd like to enter into a non-disclosure agreement with you. So that's one approach. But I think the threshold question is whether you consider this all to be part of an ongoing gaming investigation. Well, I think it depends. Um, but I, I, they, we, we've, um, we've taken the, the approach that suitability in general included financial suitability. And there's a number of documents that we request here that would fall in the financial suitability category. There's others that may not, right? Uh, but, but as I, uh, yeah, I, I agree with, I mean, I think Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner um, Zunig are on the right track here that, first of all, I don't think we want all this stuff being routinely filed okay. with us. I mean, it's just way overreaching. It's a ton of stuff that we'll never my, look at. That so, was my other point. So, right. I mean, I think we, we, we should require that we want the availability to access these, almost all of the stuff that's limited here on an exception basis when we find the need, which would only occur under a suitability investigation. We wouldn't be looking at just out of curiosity how much taxes did you pay. We would only want any of this information if we were concerned about something that was going on, whether they were financially stable, whether there was money law, you know, whatever. So if we, if we both say we don't want this, we want it available to us on reasonable notice, and when we take it, it will be protected in its confidentiality because it will be part of a suitability investigation. And that, that, that covers it. It doesn't I cover all the statutory problems, but I fully right. agree with the, with the approach. And I, I was glad we jumped there because I, I, don't know, I don't know either why we want, why we need all this stuff. Right. Uh, but I do think that, that the in investigation, we, we, we do have the power to, to construe our own statute. In 21A7, we can construe it. But I think we have to be careful about making the term investigation so broad that it's not credible. Uh, and this approach would, would solve that problem. Yeah. And I don't mean to be glib about it. I, I think that in, in good faith, the only time most of the stuff, I don't remember every single point, but virtually everything in here is only something that we would want if there was a reason to want it. And the reason could only be some concern about the condition or the activities of our licensee, which is ipso facto re related to yeah. a suitability, a perfectly legitimately construed to be under a, a, a suitability investigation. Or sometimes information leads to an investigation. So, or the option to periodically go out and review, right. to, just, are, yeah. you know, because then you may find something which But in you don't fact, go out just on fishing expeditions. No, I no, mean, no, you, it you wouldn't out, be that. No, you, it's, you have a hint, you have but, a but thought. But as a regulatory body, to, to periodically review is, I, I would think, part of our responsibility. But I think we're saying a lot of the same thing, you know, most or, you know, ho however much of that information, you know, it, it depends right. on the information. But, I, but I, I do want to pick up on uh, your earlier point, Commissioner, on, um, on this uh, matrix, this match as to um, if we could come up with, and, and maybe a lot of it is already here in the comments that MGM has provided, but a if we could match what's statutorily required and what, um, um, how we've taken that uh, and written it in regulation and what information may be sensitive. Um, we we yeah. have an example of that and, that, and and that applies to a number of statutory requirements, but we're required to do an annual audit, yes. for example. And, and I wonder if we couldn't take a hard look at uh, what, um, the SEC requirements are and yes. see if we couldn't piggyback on that. I mean, right. and have our own auditors check 
uh, in some fashion what the company's auditors are doing rather than Absolutely. create an audit that was different. So it's those kinds of things that I think would be really helpful to, to take a look at. Absolutely. Much like we did with the Massachusetts supplemental right. form, right. we could take what they do and then enhance or or whatever else, yeah. or just, or just, right. uh, uh, yeah. And I think Commissioner Cameron, even the, what you're talking about, you know, if we might sort of on a selective basis yes. feel like from time to time, that too could come right. under the suitability uh, because it's a it random check to make sure that suitability yes, is okay, is. and that still would fall under this, the, the suitability investigation that's uh, exemption. Right. That's exactly what I was thinking. Right. Sometimes you out and right. say that you have to have something, but unless you check once in a while, right. Right. some right. may not uh, be in the habit of doing it properly. Right. Or, and and I, I guess I wouldn't want to, I know a lot of work went into this, and I, I wouldn't want to just across the board say we don't need any of it. No. Um, I think uh, a right. further review uh, in this matrix should cover that. And reasons why we think we would need it would be as part of that. Right. Right. So, with a, from my standpoint, at least, with a presumption of paring back as aggressively as we can, subject to the law and you know common sense. But in general, we want to we don't want a lot of extra stuff sitting on our shelves that nobody ever looks at. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. So, is it fair to say that? Uh, We'll come back to this after further analysis. Yeah, why don't we try to rework some of the framework, really, not necessarily the yeah. substance, but the, the framework of it, and uh, report back to you at your next, right. maybe not your next meeting, the meeting after. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. What you did, I guess my question was, you did get a sense, of course, of where we, where we are, which was your question. It's very clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Anything else on this one? So we, we would ask then that you look at 205 CMR 140, which is the um, revenue reporting regulation. That has gone through the process. It is ready for promulgation. We did not receive any comments on 140, did we? Uh, there were no public comments, no public but comments. we did review this with some of our consultants, and I went through this with uh, Derek Lennon as well. And um, as I mentioned to you at the late hour, uh, there were a few adjustments that we'll recommend to you. Uh, I sent these to you via email. They're not in the packet. Um, by and large, they're not substantive changes. They're just uh, some tweaks that will help clarify exactly what we're looking at and some of the terminology. Um, and I can go through those. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to look at any of that or how you'd like to proceed. But by and large, no major comments or adjustments to this. Mm -hmm. I looked at the email, but it, it might be nice for you to just okay. point them out. That sure. might be helpful. Where's the email? Um, you sent that out yesterday. It was last yeah, it's night. not in the packet. It's, it's, in the it's out. Somewhere. Came out okay. late last night. Yes. I, I can just go through the uh, the changes really quickly. Um, so starting with uh, 140.05, we use the term certification of gross gaming revenues. It was suggested that instead of using the term certification, which we do in probably five or six places, that we use the word verification. So we're verifying the revenue. We're not certifying it. Um, okay. We are not them? That's right. Okay. It's, it's what our function is. Yes. And that we are looking at it, Fine. but we're just verifying that it's accurate, Fine. not certifying it. Okay. That's good. Okay. Uh, next one is... 140.02 paragraph C. And again, this is really just a language adjustment. It doesn't change at all. This has to do with being able to, uh, or, or the requirement that uh, any uncollectible uh, uh, amounts as a result of credit that was issued count towards your gross gaming revenue and they not be able to offset it. So we just reworked the language, taking out the first uh, part from in calculating gross gaming revenue, no adjustments shall be allowed for, strike that, and instead have it read, any amounts that a gaming licensee is unable to collect pursuant to any credit issued to a patron 
to take part in gaming activity in accordance with 205 CMR 140, uh, 3840 through 46. Here's the new language. Uh, shall be deemed as amounts actually received by a gaming licensee from gaming operations for purposes of calculating gross gaming revenue. So all we're saying is that um, the amount, even if it's uncollectible, yep. is an amount that's actually received and it counts towards your gross gaming revenue, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying it the flip way, which is that you can't offset it. That's fine. Uh, the next one is in paragraph E. Um, again, this was just kind of streamlining the language. Uh, it doesn't reflect it there in the draft, but it's the same exact uh, theory. Um, uh, this one's a little trickier. If you don't have it in, in front of you, it's a little trickier to kind of read what, through. What paragraph did it's you mention? It's paragraph E, so it's on page two at the top. Oh. Treatment of promotional yes. credits. Oh, this one. This one, yes, yes. Uh, the, this is promotional gaming credits and how that is uh, handled. Um, so I, I'll read to you what it would actually say. Uh, for purposes of calculating gross gaming revenue, the total of all sums actually received shall not include amounts that the gaming licensee can demonstrate were, and now here's the new uh, adjustment, were one, issued by the gaming licensee as promotional gaming credit as defined by Chapter 23K Section 2 to enable the patron to wager at the gaming licensee's gaming establishment. So the, the first part is that it has to be uh, issued by the gaming licensee for use at the gaming establishment. Yep. So that's part one. And then part two, we're striking no such credit. We're striking from no such credit all the way down uh, two lines, and we're picking it up at the word received, uh, which there is the uh, next to last line. So it would read, and received from a patron as a wager at a slot machine or table game in the gaming licensee's gaming establishment. So it has to be issued by the gaming licensee mm -hmm. and received by the gaming licensee to be considered a promotional uh, gaming credit. And received by the gaming patron. Received from the patron, yes. So received it's not by just the patron. They can't off. They, they can't not count it upon issuance. It has to be received back. Yes, and wagered. And wagered. Yes, right. mm -hmm. that's fine. And it can't be uh, issued at a different property elsewhere. It has yes. to be at the gaming establishment. Well, that's a statutory requirement. Yes. So that's basically, that's what we're saying. And we didn't change, yeah. that's what it yeah. said before. We're just making it a little clearer, although More it doesn't readable. seem that way at the moment. Yes. The one and two clarify. Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Um, so, well, that's just on E. Yeah. Um, is, is, there's, and there's no limit on that? There isn't. We could we could put it, but uh, there there isn't. We didn't. Yeah, that's right. We, we didn't. We, didn't we, uh, we haven't limited. There is so a mark. If, if it, it's a. Twenty percent. I mean, again, I, I don't know what the norm the norm is, but twenty percent of the of the amount wagered is promotional credits. None of that is taxable. Nope. But that would be a business decision of the licensee. At least in a theoretical sense, they're not getting any money, so that's why we're not taxing. Um, I mean, at some point, if the landscape shifts, they might start issuing. Well, my, my understanding of free play is that um, some licensees use it to dif differentiate their business strategy, and um, you know, some may may offer uh, more at different times, maybe initially to get more patrons. Um, more recurring <coughs> patrons, they may adjust it. So I think for us to try to put up um, a, a number a, 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 a around it might be a little bit um, misguided. Maybe worth revisiting in the future, that's, but at that's, the moment, that's uh, right. that we don't, we haven't done any analysis on what the number should be, if there should be a number, or anything along those lines. 
And there's no limit in the stat, no limitation on that in the statute. And there isn't. No. We, there is limitation or language in each, I believe, each of the gaming license licenses that says that they have to follow whatever the number is, but we haven't set any right. uh, number at the moment. Okay. The next uh, adjustment is just in paragraph two, right here on the same page at the bottom in, par in uh, section C. At this deals with uh, contests and tournaments and buy-ins. And essentially, um, we talk about uh, the fact that they can't use the value of a prize they pay out. Well, let me, let me back up for a second. When it comes to a contest or tournament, um, people buy into the tournament for a set fee, and then there's a prize at the end. So the chips don't really have necessarily value per se. Um, so in order to prevent the situation where you know, the buy-in's $25 and there's only 100 people and the grand prize is a million dollars and then they offset their gross gaming revenue by, you know, $950,000. We say that you can't, uh, the result of the tournament can't result in, uh, can't negatively impact your gross gaming revenue. It has to zero out yep. when it comes to that because it's not really a true reflection of your, your your tax uh, calculation when it comes as, as compared to slot machines or regular table gameplay. So we're, di we're talking about the last sentence here when we say that um, it shall in no way negatively impact gross gaming revenue. It was suggested to us that it does negatively impact gross gaming revenue. So we should kind of just reword that. It's the same concept. And instead of saying negatively impact gross gaming revenue, we would uh, uh, add in the language, it shall in no way result in a negative number being reported for purposes of the calculation of gross gaming revenue. So it's the same exact Negative concept. number being reported from that tournament. From that tournament. It still has to zero out yes. at, at the worst. Or at the best, they have that's fine. income and they pay uh, tax on it. I mean, that's the ideal, of course. Why, why don't you achieve the same result more economically by just putting a period next to tournament in the, in the uh, next to last line. Uh, I think uh, you could. I think this just clarifies the point. If you put a period in there, it says offset gross screaming revenue results in a loss. You can only recognize the loss to the extent of the payments. That's, that's absolutely right. You, if you, you could leave it there. I don't care. I just, I just offer that as a suggestion. Whatever clarifies for people. Pardon me? Whatever clarifies it for people if they think, you know. It might be the uh, belt and suspenders who are just uh, clarifying that you can't have a negative number. Uh, yep. You don't have to say it because we do tell you how to calculate it. Either way. Either way. Okay. Flip a coin. We won't spend too much more time on that. Thing. Um, in on uh, the next page, page three, three A, we added in then when when calculating the drop from slot machines, that it also should include electronic credits withdrawn from a patron's account. That's the so-called cashless wagering, which. Uh, as we generally understand it, people, they may not do, but that would be part of your drop as a general matter if you do it. And I think the rest were all just the verification versus certification. So that's, that's all I had on that one. it on that one so we just need a vote to move this forward a vote to approve one, this regulation I have one more um, I thought in a prior meeting on, on you know paragraph um, three slot machines and electronic gaming devices where we say central monitoring system vendor didn't we leave that general 
as determined by the Commission. I'm sorry. I was do, you just do you recall that? Uh, leaving it general? I, um, I, I believe I, I, I made a point about not codifying in regulation the central monitoring system's vendor. Oh. As we might one day be the ones making that calculation. So just U using, saying. Using whatever tool, including the central monitoring system. Uh, so just calculated by the Commission? Yeah. Period. That would be my, my preference. I think that's it's the same effect. It's of, the same effect, right. But we would effectively, at, at least at first, be doing it by way of the central monitoring system. We can system. use whatever we want, okay. including the central monitoring system that we're installing. That should work, I'd make that adjustment. Is there any reason why we have to do this today as opposed to next week? No. I, I, would, no. I would really prefer to see that these are not just, and I, I think I understand them all, but I would really like to take a look at uh, what comes out of this good discussion uh, before approving it. See them in red. See them in red, yeah. And you're yeah. only talking about 140, not 139. That's no, no. a bigger right. issue. 139 yeah. is a much bigger issue. Right. And I, so I, 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 we can put this on the agenda for next week at the tail end of that special meeting. It wouldn't take us five minutes, and, and I'd prefer to do it that way. Fine. But Fine by me. as well. I'll give Commissioner McHugh my proxy. Okay. Okay, so we are down to item D, mechanical correction. So item D is truly a mechanical correction. Um, it is a correction to our regulation 102.03. We talked about, it's the granting of a variance or a waiver section. Um, our language said that we could grant variance or waivers to regulations 205 CMR 101 through 131. We now have gone way past 131. So we would just like to amend that to delete the reference to 101 through 131 and just leave it in 205 CMR. That way we don't have to come back and amend it. So we need your approval to make that technical amendment. It is truly a technical amendment. I but we now have another provision um, uh, in regulations we just uh, talked about that there is no um, waiver or variance from the credit regulations. Mm -hmm. And and this, does this set up a conflict between that, that provision part? and this one? Well, yeah. what we could do here is say except as otherwise provided. It, and then just take, put that with the 205 CMR because we may have other sections in the future where we right. don't allow right. for waivers. Right. So, but don't we um, allow a waiver? Don't we prohibit waivers unless we don't prohibit waivers? I mean, can't we waive that prohibition? I, I think that's right. I think this section My regulation. It, it just gives you the flexibility to grant a waiver. So in theory, if someone came to you and said, I want a variance from the credit regulations, you, as a commission, could grant that waiver. Uh, you don't necessarily need to box yourselves in. The reason we put that restriction in the other set of regulations was because it wouldn't be coming to you for review. It would be up to the executive director to make that call. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's true. So and we would have to, uh, and it would have to come to uh, If it came to us, it would come to us in a public hearing and be vetted. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, but, okay. I mean, you may okay. want to. And we would want to apply these criteria to that if right. it did come mm -hmm. to us. That's right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Further discussion on this? Do we have a motion? Somebody? Sure. Sure, I can uh, move that we, well, is this, is this by emergency or is this to get into regular? Uh, this will go through the regular process, I regular believe. Process. I do we need okay. to do this by emergency? I, I don't think so. We'll That's take it through maybe, the regular well, process. Maybe we should, just so we have the authority to grant. Grant in case something comes up. Right. Well, let's, yeah. Yes, let's do it by emergency, and then we'll run it through after that. So. Okay, so I would move that uh, this commission approve the uh, mechanical uh, correction to regulation 205 CMR 102 
0.03 as presented here in the packet uh, and uh, promulgate that by emergency and at the same time uh, start the normal promulgation process. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director Wells. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. I will be actually quite brief this afternoon. Nice. On the, first, <laughs> the first item on the agenda, uh, we have a, a key gaming uh, executive license uh, the uh, application for Jeremy Howland. Uh, you see the IEB investigatory report is completed. Um, in December of 2014, Mr. Howland was promoted to Vice President of Finance. He's the Chief of Finance, uh, Financial Officer for Plain Ridge Park Casino in Plain Ridge, Mass. Prior to this promotion, he was the Director of Finance at Hollywood Casino located in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Mr. Howland submitted all the required forms and supplemental documents um, to the licensing division and the IEB. Investigators conducted a uh, rigorous background check for this license. Areas covered, uh, if you've uh, been informed previously for other uh, individuals who have been subject to a background check, we look at the employment history, the criminal record, education, political contributions, references, media coverage, directorships and shareholder interests, civil litigation, bankruptcies and property ownerships. Um, Mr. Howland was also interviewed in person by the IEB state police and financial investigators as part of the game, key gaming employee investigation protocol. They conduct, also conducted a financial responsibility invest, evaluation with positive results for Mr. Howland. Uh, he, Mr. Howland attended Missouri Southern State University, which he was awarded a BA in business administration and accounting uh, with a minor in computer information, graduating in 2001. Prior to that, he also attended Crowder College, where he was awarded an Associates of Arts degree in business administration, graduating in 1999. As I previously stated, he's currently the Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Prior to that, he'd worked as Director of Finance uh, for Penn National Gaming in Ohio. And he, prior to that, he had been a financial controller for a Penn National Gaming facility in Missouri and an accounting manager uh, at a, a casino and resort in Oklahoma. And prior to that, a controller for Sitton uh, Motor Lines in Missouri. Mr. Howland disclosed he has been uh, licensed or registered partic to participate in some sort of, ga sort of gaming activity in three jurisdictions in the United States. Uh, check with Kansas, Ohio, and Missouri confirmed uh, that his license uh, in Ohio was active and in good standing. Uh, Missouri Gaming Commission was uh, active and in good standing. And in the Quapaw Tribal Gaming Agency, uh, that was inactive, but there were no issues to report. All of his licenses were in, were in good standing, and all jurisdictions contacted reported no derogatory information relating to his licensure. As you'll note in the report, there was uh, one matter which the investigators noted about uh, in June of 2014 at, uh, after a hearing held at the request of Mr. Howland. Um, the Missouri Gaming Commission adopted its preliminary order dated September 20th, 2013 to impose a one-day calendar suspension uh, for conduct from conducting casino business uh, for, against Mr. Howland. The discipline stemmed from actions of Mr. Howland when he was the financial controller at the Arogacy Riverside Casino in Riverside, Missouri, which is owned and operated by Penn National Gaming. According to the Commission's order, Mr. Howland, in conjunction with the slot machine manufacturer, timely investigated several variances between slot machine meters and the computer management system that occurred over the course of two gaming days in December of 2012. Uh, Mr. Howard concluded an adjustment should be made to the game meter and the correction uh, result in a difference um, in the adjusted gross gaming row and gaming tax. Uh, later, the investigator from Missouri Gaming Commission determined the variance was attributable not to the incorrect meter readings, as Mr. Howland concluded, but rather incorrect postings to the system. As a result, um, they determined he had not met his burden of proving by clear and convincing evidence the investigation of the variance was, was sufficient. Ultimately, he did not serve the one-day suspension because of the time of the commission's order. He had been promoted to director of finance at Hollywood Casino, located in Columbus, Ohio, also owned and operated by Penn National Gaming. Uh, that was the, the one minor incident that was discovered during the investigation. He remains licensed in good standing uh, in Missouri. Overall, there were no significant investigative issues uncovered related to Mr. Howland's application for licensure. 
Overall, he demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence he is suitable for licensure in Massachusetts, and therefore the IEB is recommending that the commission find him suitable. Thank you. Questions, comments? A uh, very comprehensive and uh, well done report. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would agree, and the one issue is uh, minor in it's, nature. Right. Absolutely. Any, anything else? No, just looking for a vote, sir. Right. Yep. Mr. Cameron? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve uh, the license from Mr. Jeremy Howland as a qualifier. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Uh, I'll defer to General Counsel Blue on uh, agenda uh, item B on the under the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau. Um, under the, our regulations for vendor licensing, 205 CMR 13404, there are certain exemptions for certain exemptions that detail vendors that need not be licensed. Um, it's section 6A through N. Section, section 6A to M are very specific. They talk about doctors, lawyers, um, advertising services, things like that. There is a catch-all exemption. It's section 6N, and it provides an exemption for any other person that by submission of a written petition can demonstrate to the commission that regulation as a non-gaming vendor is not necessary to protect the public interest. The way the regulation is currently drafted, that would require all of those petitions to come before the commission. And in some cases, maybe that would make sense, but most of them that we're seeing now are things that we can work with the IEB, IEB and legal and their enforcement council to kind of review that and determine whether that makes sense. So I would ask that the commission consider a delegation of authority to the director of IEB to work with the legal department to make those decisions and then come back and report to the commission when an exemption under that section is granted. I think ultimately what we would like to see is to see under that section whether we see any patterns of certain types of exemptions that are made all the time, and then we could consider going back to amending our regulation to create a more specific exemption for that. But we do, we have come across several types of services or types of entities that would benefit from that exemption. Like what's an example? Well, the one that we've been talking about, for example, is lobbying services, because that, in that situation, it's highly regulated by another agency of the Commonwealth. Um, we think that that is sufficient in most cases to, to protect the public interest. So we would, we would want to do that under this catch-all at the moment, but then look to see how many of those perhaps we get and see if that warrants an exemption on its own. We also had the question of the, the advertisers, I think, for the the racing program fall into this category as well? Yes. Um, our regulation, the way it's constructed, deals with services that the licensee buys, but there are also people who buy services from the licensee. So a good example of that is someone who wants to put an ad in a racing program or someone who wants to hang a, a banner from, you know, the ceiling of a casino. In those cases, we might be able to determine that that's where the licensee is selling a service to a particular vendor. And having that vendor really register doesn't make, doesn't make sense particularly. So that would be something that right now would come under this catch-all exemption. I, I, would, uh, I would agree with that. I know that uh, um, Director Wells, um, you know, he's under crunch time on a number of fronts here. And if this provides, you know, a little bit of a, uh, the ability to make a judgment call, um, you know, for the time being, that might that might go a long way um, to help and um, you know report back to see if you uh, if you see trends if you really if you if you're truly using it as an exemption uh, as an exception um, you know I would be I would be fine with that maybe just as as with some of these other things just let us know maybe some kind of a each month or week or something there's right, a similar to the yeah similar, similar to the temporary, the temporary licenses right. yes we would exactly. do a report right. I'm fine with that. Everybody else? Commissioner McHugh? I, I'm fine with it in principle. I, I would really like to see it in writing um, so that everybody is sure of what we're doing here. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one that's confused and I'm still the, on vacation. The delegation in writing or the decision? No, the, the, what it is that we're, what it is that we're, 
delegating to whom for what. Oh, okay. We can we can make a written delegation, yes, and we could bring that back too at the next meeting if that would make you yeah, more comfortable. It seems to me in principle that this makes sense, but it, it, it seems to me that everybody ought to understand exactly what's happening here. The public included. Okay. But we're certainly welcome to take them, you know, it could be on our website or call somebody or whatever. Um, okay, so we'll. I'll draft so that and we'll bring like it back for our next meeting. Seems like everybody's basically fine, but it ought to be clear on a piece of paper so we are formal about what we're delegating. Right? We can Since. do that. Okay. okay. And then the final item on the agenda is uh, under section uh, C is just the notice to the commission. The IEB, we did grant uh, one key gaming employee license to Jason Gittle, the IT director of Plainfield Gaming and Redevelopment, did that on April 27th of this year. Uh, the application uh, was deemed complete by the Division of Licensing and the petitioner certified and the IEB found that after reviewing the post proposed operational plan for the facility that the temporary license is necessary for the operation of the gaming establishment given their planned opening in the end of June and is not designed to circumvent normal licensing proce procedures. The IEB also found that it was reasonably likely uh, that the uh, that the a license would be granted upon the completion of the investigation. So it's just a notice for the commission you to take no action. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank that's you. That's it for today. Thank you. Thank you, Director. I think that's Thank it. You, Director Day, that's everything. I have nothing further. Um, just a couple of scheduling matters. It was already mentioned that we have called an extraordinary meeting um, for next Wednesday at 10.30 at the BCEC, at the Convention Center, not here. Wednesday, 10.30, uh, mostly to do with the suitability background check, but a couple of other random items, uh, the, the suitability check for the Brockton applicant. Uh, and then we will be back on the 14th to our regular scheduled meeting on Thursday, and the meeting on the 14th will be here at the Heinz. Motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you.